Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If you're watching this at home, do not adjust your dial. You are seeing what you are seeing. We are the school committee. We have taken over the selectmen's chambers. The coup d'etat is successful. We are now running the town. Now, now who wants to be on the parking committee? <laughs> Okay. No we only have one volunteer, so maybe that wasn't such a good idea. So That's back it. to I'm school committee. committee business. You want to be the committee itself? The committee. Good. Uh, can you write Parking tickets ours. on my street, please? Sure. Thank you. Um, we start off with some sad news. <coughs> it's with sadness that I inform you of the passing of Jack Burns. Jack was the husband of an Arlington Public Schools or retired employee, Ann Burns, who we all interacted with uh, from. 1976 <coughs> to 2005, the father of former Arlington School Committee member Denise Burns, who served with us from 2007 to 2010, and the father of Claire Roberts, current Town of Arlington Human Resource Assistant. So we will have a moment of silence in the memory of Jack Burns. Thank you very much. Our first order of business is a recognition of Victoria Rose, the Thompson Administrative Assistant. With much joy, I pass the baton to Superintendent Bodie. Yes, thank you very much. We're here this evening to honor Vicki Rose, and I'm actually going to pass the microphone over to Siobhan Foley, who is not only a teacher in the third grade at Thompson, knows Vicki very well, but also is the Vice President of the Arlington Educator Association. So, Ms. Foley. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> so, it is with great honor that I am here to present this to Vicki Rose. I have said, I have been quoted saying this before, that Vicki is the heart and soul of Thompson School. Um, Vicki started as a parent four children in the Thompson schools with her husband, Brian, and she started from there reaching out to the families all around our school. Um, she then became a parent liaison contact. Well, that was the position that Vicki held when I was hired there uh, oof, 16 years ago, 17 years ago. And then Vicki, um, and through that contact, Vicki was able to do many different things, such as a seconds market, um, using the, the, so the unsold produce from the farmer's market would be given to needy families. She always knew the families who needed the most help, always. When Vicki was hired as our secretary, that never stopped. She still continued to always reach out to all of the parents in our community who need her help. And in that process, she has also been a co-founder of the Arlington Eats program, which has been widely successful. Um, she continues to find new ways all the time to help those families. If you ask her any question about any of those families, Vicki can tell you where they are, how they're doing, um, where the kids are that were in my class so many years ago and how they're doing. She's just still that heart and soul on top of doing an incredibly busy um, secretary job, manning all of those now doors that we have, <laughs> and <laughs> answering the phone and everything else that she's required to do. I can't say enough, and Vicki getting the award for Unsung Hero um, from the state legislature was just phenomenal, but just not even enough for everything that she has done for us. So, Vicki. Thank you. Thank you, and I could not add anything more other than say she is just really an amazing, remarkable woman who I've had the privilege of knowing for a long time, and uh, every, this award is so well deserved, and you have our um, undying gratitude. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you. 
Thank you. We uh, now have public participation. We have one member of the public who has signed up, uh, Alex Moisson. Alex. Hello. <clears throat> uh, so my name is Alexi Moisson. I'm the office manager for LARP Adventure Program. Uh, we are an after-school enrichment organization in Arlington that serves 60 students ages 11 to 18. Uh, using a multidisciplinary theater curriculum. And we are one of the subleasers of the Arlington Center for the Arts. Uh, so I'm sure you'll have plenty to hear today about why Arlington Center for the Arts is important. But I just wanted to share a, a personal story from our organization. Uh, two years ago, we were no longer able to continue uh, working at the Audison Middle School, and we had to find a new home for our organization. And we spent a summer looking everywhere for a new place to host our 60 students um, in Arlington. And we were about to give up that hope. Uh, there was the possibility our program would no longer be able to continue. And the person that came out of the blue and saved us was the Arlington Center for the Arts. For so many artists, they provide a home where none other exists. It's an invaluable part of Arlington, something that I don't see mimics in any other town that I work with, and it would be Truly a shame if that opportunity was lost to the students and a wider Arlington community. Uh, so please, 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 as you consider all the important decisions you have to make, consider that. Thank you. Okay, we now have 30 minutes allotted in the agenda for a conversation with the Gibbs tenants. Um, we are asking for representatives of the uh, Gibbs tenants to make their presentation. Uh, brief presentations are better because this is our one opportunity as a board to then come back and ask you questions and talk to you because one of the limits in our ability to discuss and make a decision is because of the open meeting law, every conversation we have with each other must be in a for an open forum such as this. So it will be a restrictive environment. This is a formal meeting of the school committee and people will be asked to make a presentation and then after the four presentations are done with, members of the committee will be asked to ask questions or make comments based on what they hear to the people who have made a presentation. That will be the limit of the discussion so that it, the people who are on the agenda here will be the representatives of the four organizations here tonight. And I appreciate your patience for that. The first one up, and we're gonna go through all four and then we'll come up and, and let the board go and ask questions. First one is Marion Racaponi, Executive Director of Learn to Grow. Marion, welcome. Good evening, my name is Marianne Ricciapi, Executive Director of Learn to Grow. Almost 30 years ago, I founded our early childhood school, Learn to Grow, located at the Gibbs, where we prepare children for entry into our public schools. I grew up and went to school here in Arlington. I've been an educator all my life. What I have to say is crucially important because it concerns many children here in Arlington. The school committee is faced with the problem of growing enrollment of children attending our schools grades K through 12. It is vital to also understand that the same growing enrollment problem exists for children attending schools like ours ages one to six. Our school Learn to Grow with 100 children and a wait list of 50 more is comprised of families with both parents working. Closing our school will have devastating impact on them. It's important to note that the majority of our children are from East Arlington and rely on us in our location at the Gibbs. Many have either one car or no car or rely on public transportation. There are no options for us to move in East Arlington, none. I have searched for years for additional space. Please do not think of us as tenants. We are long-term integrated community organizations at the Gibbs that provide Arlington families vital needed services. Any proposal to change and eliminate our services will only be an attempt to solve one problem, but in turn creates another one for our Arlington families. Almost 30 years ago, the leaders in town were very thoughtful as to how to use the Gibbs. They recognized that the organizations that would use the Gibbs must integrate and provide crucial services to both our children and adults in our community. 
Learn to Grow is the only National Association of Education of Young Children accredited school in Arlington. We have educated thousands of Arlington children and have become central to Arlington's early childhood community as a premier educator of young children. Our reputation within the community is reflected in many ways, from our enrollment in our school to graduates of our school coming back to work as teachers. Educators and parents know that our strong preschool programs are crucial for children as we prepare them to enter into public school. Learn to Grow is needed in this community. The program is an important partner to our Arlington schools as our highly experienced administration and teachers work closely with the Arlington Public Schools, <coughs> preparing children academically, socially, for grade school, including children that are in need of special education services. Each year, we prepare 90 to 100 Arlington children entering into Arlington Public Schools, representing more than 80 families. For those of you with children that went to preschool, imagine that being taken away. Imagine me having to tell our hardworking teachers, also Arlington residents, that they're out of a job, many of whom have worked at Learn to Grow for over 25 years. In addition, our school contributes to the community with free workshops for parents and children, local events for the community, collaboration with the Arlington Recreation Department and joint events, and outreach to our local food pantry and spending time with our senior citizens. We assist local Arlington residents by permitting them to participate in our school as part of their college curriculum. Additionally, we work with Harvard University to conduct research in language arts stud studies. I'd like to leave you with this very important thought. All of us at the Gibbs serve hundreds, if not thousands of children and adults in our community each year. <clears throat> Let me repeat that. All of us at the Gibbs serve hundreds, if not thousands, of children and adults in our community each year. Displacing us is not much different than closing one of our current nine public schools. We would not even think of it, not just because it's our collective responsibility to care for and educate our children, but because it would also cause unthinkable disruptions to the families we all serve. As a community, we have an equal responsibility for children ages one to six, as we do for children six to 18. I know it is crucial for all of us to work together to find the best solution for our children here in Arlington, but together we need to find a solution for all our Arlington children. We're an important, connected partner to our Arlington schools. My staff and I are ready to help and look forward to working with all areas of town government to resolve this challenge. I have two of my Arlington parents who would also like to be heard as part of my allotted time. <laughs> so. well, thank you. My name is Edith One, and my husband and I live in East Arlington, and we have a daughter who is two years old who is currently in the toddler program at Learn to Grow and will be starting preschool in December. Uh, and, please, for the record, please identify with your address, please. Oh, I live in Marathon Street. Okay. Okay, and um, I believe that place is in the, in the Thompson School District mm -hmm. on our end of um, Marathon Street. And tonight, I just wanted to share my perspective as a parent of a toddler who uh, is in a uh, preschool, will soon be starting a preschool program, and will also be entering the public schools in a few years. And I recognize that there are some space issues um, but what I wanted to bring up is the fact that while there were several options presented several weeks ago at the school committee meeting that I attended, it didn't seem like any of them really addressed all the needs of, of the public school system. And many of the options seemed like they would address some of the needs, but also place at great risk the early education programs that are currently in the Gibbs. I know that in addition to Learn to Grow, there are also programs at the Leslie Ellis School, and um, the town, I believe, also runs a program that takes place in the gymnasium. Um, when my husband and I were looking at childcare options, there was only one that worked for our commutes. We both work in Cambridge that were close enough to our house who would take my daughter when she was one year old, and that one place was Learn to Grow. And we were fortunate that we got off the wait list, and that's not always the case. Um, we have neighbors down the street who wanted to send their daughter to Learn to Grow, but they couldn't get off the wait list. So just as there is a need in future years to serve children from kindergarten on up, there's a need currently right now to preserve childcare options in East Arlington. So my concern is that we haven't, as a community, explored all the possible options to make sure we have the proper facilities for our older children while also preserving the facilities we need for our younger children. And these are the same students who will be entering kindergarten in a few years. And my hope is that we can talk and generate more ideas so that we can come to a solution 
that serves everyone as opposed to coming up with a solution that we devise quickly but maybe may not meet all of our needs. So um, if I can be helpful in any way, I'd be happy to continue to talk to anyone further about those, about generating new options and working together as a town. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Megan Panzano, and I'm the mom of a preschool student who's currently enrolled at Learn to Grow, located in the Gibbs building. My husband and I both work full time, and we rely on this program, as Edith was just referring to, um, to make the many aspects of our family's life possible. I live also at Alton Street in Arlington, just for the record. Um, we're homeowners on Alton Street near Arlington Center, and we selected Learn to Grow both for the strong educational base it would provide to our son, as well as for its specific geographic location within walking distance from home and directly in the center of the neighborhoods that feed into the Thompson Elementary School, where our son will eventually be a student. We saw the location of our son's preschool as a critical community building catalyst for our family allowing our son to develop a strong group of local neighborhood friends that he could track through the Arlington school system with, as well as enabling our family to share roots with other families likewise balancing professional and parental priorities in our incredible town of Arlington. I'm an architect, a practicing designer, and a design critic of architecture at Harvard's Graduate School of Design where I teach architecture studio. As both an architect and as a member of the Arlington community with a child already in the early stages of his preparatory elementary school education at Learn to Grow, I'm concerned with a number of aspects consistent across all of the space planning schemes proposed at the school committee meeting held on September 24th. First, that the Gibbs building, an older and relatively small building with significant square footage limitations in its current form, was required in the space planning of three of four proposals without greatly impacting the capacity challenges of the school system at large. Second, that all schemes limited the scope of producing additional educational space critical in our school system to modular buildings in either multi-year temporary or permanent service for the creation of classroom spaces to meet the projected student populations an expensive proposition for modulars that through their longevity as they're proposed in any of the schemes would require superior finishing to make them truly functional spaces in New England throughout the duration of the school year, which would include additional insulation, more permanent and durable building enclosure materials, among other costly details. Lastly, and most troubling to me from last meeting was the absence of any option that proposed the expansion of core shared spaces in the schools inclusive of cafeterias, gymnasiums, auditorium spaces, and libraries. Spaces extremely critical to meeting the functional and educational needs of any school location for any students at any grade level. Modular classrooms, modulars, as they're proposed, add classroom spaces only, but what about these core communal spaces as well? So I ask, where are other space planning options for the expansion of the schools in our system? that would meet the projected capacity needs of both classrooms as well as these core communal spaces. Renovation proposals that permanently expand the footprint of existing buildings, both classroom and core spaces on site is but one of these. And I ask that we please investigate these options that would focus on providing both classroom and core space growth on school sites, which would allow the many programs currently located in the Gibbs building to remain in that space, critically located in the core of the communities that they serve. Thank you. Is the time note we're 10 minutes into the uh, agenda item. Linda Shu, uh, may I ask that you not hold up banners or demonstrate in the chambers? Thank you very much. Uh, Linda Shoemaker, uh, you're on. Hi, thanks. So I'm Linda Shoemaker, the executive director of the Arlington Center for the Arts. 27 years ago, uh, when the Gibbs building went offline, mm -hmm. the town made a, del a deliberate and strategic decision to allocate some of that space to de de be developed into an art center. The town believed that investment in the arts would pay off in economic development, new business, rising property values, and a cultural vibrancy that would make people want to live in Arlington. Since that time, ACA has been both a foundation and a catalyst for the cultural life and creative economy in Arlington. 
the last time we met at the last town meeting uh, in, in town hall, uh, I spoke about the, the hundreds, the thousands of creative kids and families that ACA serves with its programs. Some of them are here tonight. Um, these programs are life-changing, sometimes life-saving. And I know, I know you believe in the quality and the importance of these programs. Some of you have children involved in these programs. I can only appreciate how challenging this is for, for you. It's been suggested to me that maybe the schools could partner with the Art Center, maybe could provide some space within the schools to try to find a place to find some creative space sharing solutions. But what I really want to share with you today is that the Art Center is not just a program or a series of programs uh, that could be run inside somebody else's space. The Arlington Center for the Arts is in fact pretty much a 24-7 operation and having that dedicated space and the dedicated facilities is critical. ACA's artist studios provide 16 working artists with their livelihoods. These are full-time photographers, painters, musicians. Some of them are here tonight. ACA's galleries provide 200 or more local artists a year with an opportunity to show and sell their work. Some of them are here tonight. Space like this, ex exhibition space, studio space, is shrinking all over the area. It's harder and harder to get this kind of space. ACA's classrooms provide, in addition to the programs that we do for kids and teens, opportunities for hundreds of adults a year, both to learn and to teach. That's an important part of what we do. And ACA's theater space provides a place for our community's, community's musicians and performers. Last year, we had more than 150 performances in that theater of local bands, theater groups, and uh, workshops and classes right here in our own community. And of course, the Arlington Center for the Arts is a critical place for our, ki our community's creative kids and teens, and there's a lovely group of them here tonight. This is, these people, this organization is the manifestation of that vision of Arlington's community planners 30 years ago, a cultural institution that provides opportunities to experience the joys of creativity and to be a spark to the local creative economy. I've had a lot of people come up to me in the last two months and say, don't worry, we're going to find you a place. There's got to be a, there's got to be a solution. There's got to be a place. But I am worried. And these, these people are worried. I know that we want to believe there's a way to do this somehow, find another place for the art center, um, to recreate the programs somewhere else. But I look around. That space is not to be found. There, there is no comparable facility that could provide the kind of the resources that we do in running the kids' camp, in the artist studios, the theater, and all of these other activities. And I think about the history of Belmont. Some of you may, may remember the Kendall Center for the Arts in Belmont. It was an art center very much like ACA, a retired school building, artist studios, gallery, classes. It burned down in April of 1999. The town found temporary quarters for some of those people in programs and said, we'll figure it out. We'll find another place for that organization to be. 16 years later, it's never happened. That place is not going to come back to life. It's over. And I just can't imagine that Arlington is going to let, can let that happen to the Arlington Center for the Arts. We have way too much to lose. It's not that easy to create an art center. This one has taken 30 years to come into being. So I know this is a critical, important moment for Arlington to figure out what to do. We are committed to providing a top-notch education to our kids. We share that. Everyone in this room shares that. We're also committed to having a town with an active cultural life for these very kids and families who are moving into town. For me, what I believe is that in the case of both of those goals, the best solution is to leave ACA and our, and our neighboring tenants in this 100-year-old aging school building and find a better, newer, more educationally sound solution for Arlington's kids. And uh, as Marianne said, we all stand ready to work with the school committee to find a better solution for all of the con constituencies in Arlington. Thank you. Gina Jones from the Kelleher Center. No, I am not Gina Jones. <laughs> My name is Ellen Dalton, and I serve as the Senior Vice President for Elliott Community Ser Human Services which oversees the Keller Center. Uh -huh. 
and I'm here to talk with you tonight. Um, the Kelleher Center has been located at the Gibbs School for over 25 years. Many of the folks that, that attend the Kelleher Center have been attending for 25 years. Uh, we serve men and women with developmental, intellectual, di di excuse me, disabilities, and folks with brain injury. These are folks that come mostly from the Arlington community. Um, they've spent most of their adult life participating at, at the Kelleher Center. Activities both uh, involved with employment training, employment support, uh, daily living skills, uh, skill building, and a number of therapies, physical therapy, uh, uh, art therapy, music therapy, occupational therapy. So it has, it has a very uh, rich core of services that these folks are, are totally dependent upon. Um, but it's more than a day program. It's a safe haven. It's where they spend their days among friends, receiving the care and the support they deserve and need. <clears throat> Without, without this center, without the Kelleher Center, many of these folks would be left sitting at home, sitting in a chair watching TV, or even worse, wandering the streets. This gives real meaning to their lives and to their days. And we are committed to continuing to provide these essential services. Um, we're part of the fabric of the Arlington community. Yeah, we, our, our folks, our staff, we shop, we eat, we work, we volunteer in Arlington, we have folks that uh, deliver Meals on Wheels, we have um, people that volunteer at the Salvation Army, they work at Stop and Shop, they're at Walgreens, they're um, throughout the Arlington community and feel very much connected to um, all that goes on within the community. Um, I think, you know, Elliot contributes to the economy. We provide jobs, we deliver essential services, and we participate in the daily life of Arlington. Our, our footprint, Elliot's footprint, extends beyond just the Kelleher Center. We run group homes. We have uh, a, a number of indi individuals who are living in the community that we provide support to, and we do some office uh, work in the, um, in the community. So Elliot has, has a... Um, number of people, staff and individuals who live within Arlington and Kelleher is really a, a, a mainstay for the quality of their lives. You know, I, I know that the town has been so generous in, in leasing the space to Kelleher for the past 25 years. It really, we really do appreciate it. Um, it's, it's affordable space. We're a nonprofit. And as most people know, human services is not particularly well-funded. Um, the, the disenfranchised population does not always receive all, all that is needed to give them the quality of life that they deserve. I guess our concern is, if we can't be at the Gibbs School, where will we go? I mean, we, we just don't have the um, financial means to uh, maneuver in, in the real estate market these days. Um, the bigger problem is that to take 100 adults with developmental disabilities who appear different and ask another community to open their arms and welcome us will be next to impossible. I'm sorry to say that NIMBY, not in my backyard, is alive and well. Arlington has been amazing and wonderful and welcoming, and we truly appreciate that and know that we wouldn't find this in many other communities. So if we do lose the space, we don't know the future of the Kelleher Center. There'll be 100 dis disadvantaged and disabled people who will have to figure out how to structure their days, and I think that will mean for a lot of people there will be nothing sitting and waiting for the time to pass. And there are no other centers like Kelleher in the Arlington area or within, within a, a, a radius. Um, if, the, if by chance some of them can move to other services, that's great, but they do not do well with change. Our folks uh, really need the safety and security and the routine that the Kelleher Center provides them. So I guess 
what we are asking tonight is that you think long and hard about your decision. It has huge, huge implications for more than 100 of your community members who've struggled all their lives. This is their safe haven, and the future of Kelleher rests with you. Thank you. Now, you are Ted Wilson. Am I the last? Yes, uh, Ted three, Wilson three is the executive director right. of schools Thank for you. children. There you go, he took half of my speech. Um, so we operate the Leslie Ellis School out of the Gibbs, uh, the Dearborn Academy out of the Crosby School, and another program in the, in the uh, Central School. Uh, we also have uh, many employees, many of them work in Arlington. Um, we contribute to the economy. Um, you know, and, and I was trying to think of what I was gonna say tonight, and I'm not gonna talk about Leslie Ellis because you already know about Leslie Ellis and all that sort of stuff. I try to put myself in the position of, of a school committee member. I, I was one once upon a time when I was a younger man. Um, and my belief is that you value everything that we are doing in the Gibbs right now. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any doubt that we are all valuing the service and what have you that's being provided. So. Um, my sense is that you won't be making decisions based on how good we are, um, as much as I might want you to do that. Um, but you've also indicated that you're very open to, commu to receiving community input. Um, and I take that at face value and believe that um, there are additional options that need to be expressed, so I'd like to use my last couple minutes just to share one of them and make a couple, re a couple requests. Um, I am a career educator. Um, I like to think I have a, a good feel for what you're struggling with. I'm also committed to supporting schools and doing what's best for every child. So I just want to propose one more option for you to consider uh, on the list. It's not on the list provided by the architects, um, but it's one that based on the, uh, the, what I think is the current project most likely to get outside funding. Uh, and that's the high school. Now, I know that's still a, a, pro, a work in progress, but it feels to me like that's at least one that's, that's in the channels and has a chance. Um, and to me, that project holds the key to addressing many of the enrollment issues you're facing, and uh, it could very well have a funding stream to support it. And uh, what I look at is rather than try to create a, a pedagogy to justify forming a single grade school, because I think I think that's what you end up doing, is, is creating pedagogy around you know, a need. Um, I'd like to suggest that you uh, look hard at the idea of having an eight through 12 uh, high school, uh, restructured high school. That single decision, as I look at the numbers, would immediately address the long-term projected overcrowding at the, at the Audison, which seems to be the primary reason to consider repurposing the 87-year-old Gibbs. Uh, the pedagogical approach for serving students in the 8th through 12th grades in one facility is more tested and legitimate than the alternatives which have been proposed, in my opinion. I submit that option should be put through the same analysis that the other options have received to see how it stacks up. So that's my one great idea. I have two requests. Paul, the chair stated at the last meeting that the community is going to form a broad task force to work through uh, this very complicated issue we would request to be kept informed of the composition of that task force and its meeting schedule so that we can fully participate in the discussions to be held. Um, even better, if we could somehow have a position on that task force. We represent a, a very important part of the Arlington community. I think we could bring value to that discussion. The second thing uh, that I would request is if by the end of December, I'm putting that date out, I don't know what your timeline is, but giving us a projected timeline, showing us the decision points and which town body is responsible for, for making those because we know that this is a, a community effort. There's gonna be this staging of meetings. It would really help us to, uh, to know what that's gonna look like and how that's gonna play out. Obviously, whether you end up deciding to solve Arlington's enrollment surge by modifying the renovation plans for the high school and purchasing or leasing state-of-the-art prefabricated buildings, notice I didn't say modulars, uh, or by taking back and repurposing the 87-year-old Gibbs, each of the tenants remains committed to seeking stable and permanent homes in Arlington. We're part of this community. We believe in its vision to be a diverse and exciting place, place to live and work. And we really appreciate you putting us on the, the list tonight and, and listening. So, thank you. 
Thank you very much. The only people who really haven't had a chance to converse about this, uh, certainly not publicly, are the members of this committee. So at this point, I'm going to go around to the members of the committee and allow them to uh, discuss what they're thinking and ask any questions of anybody who is presented tonight or to the superintendent or to anyone else they might uh, care to direct a question to. And I'll start with Ms. Starks. All right. Thanks, Paul. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone here knows how much we support everything that goes on in the Gibbs and that this is not an us versus them and we certainly are not looking to evict or shut down anyone. As a matter of fact, it's not even really just our decision. If you were at the meeting two weeks ago, you saw over 250 people showed up. And what I read from that meeting and what everybody said and what, what I think the decision that has to be made and what I want you to understand, and I really appreciate that everyone is here tonight, is that this is not just our decision. This is going to be a townwide decision. And that I hope that you continue to make your voices heard, not just with us, but with every single group that is going to be part of this decision. And that is going to include the town manager, the people who normally sit in these seats, the Board of Selectmen, the Finance Committee, and the Permanent Town Building Committee. Because no matter what decision we may think we want to make, we don't have any money. <laughs> the people with the money have to help us make this decision. Now, I am personally, my family has benefited from m so many of the programs at the Gibbs. I personally, I remember when Tot Stop was there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is no way that we are looking to do anything that is just like get those people out, put our school kids in. That is not what we're looking to do. And I really want to make sure that you understand that we are not in any way looking to do that. That this is a decision that is going to be made by the community. We hear you. I have my button. Okay, <laughs> I am with you. I think that we are all with you. I just want to make sure that you understand that we are all working on this. I know this is a hard decision. I don't want to evict anyone from anyone's home. I know that's what it feels like. But I do want you to know that we are working on this and that we want to work with you. We are not working against you. I really want to make sure that people understand that. And I really appreciate that everyone came out. I know that you probably all don't generally come to meetings you know, on <laughs> Thursday nights like us. Um, so please, make sure your voices are heard. Make sure your stories are told to everyone, not just us, because we are simply a part of this decision, okay? Um, and we are also going to weigh in on things and help make that decision, but it's not going to be our decision alone. I just really want to make sure that you understand that this is uh, something that we're going to try to do with everyone. And I agree, Ted, that I want to make sure that people in the, Gibbs in, the, in the current Gibbs tenants are on that committee, that everyone in town knows what the mm -hmm. timeline is and what the decision points are, mm -hmm. and that everyone who wants to be a part of that helps make those decisions, mm -hmm. okay? I agree. I want to see a thriving artistic community in this town. I don't think anyone wants to see that go away. We all just are feeling this, you know, I feel like we're in this box and now the box is getting so full and we're just not really sure where to go. All right, and I really appreciate everyone coming out and telling us all this stuff. This is great information. I just want to make sure that it gets to everyone else, right? All those other people who are involved in the process. So thank you. Dr. Seuss? Uh, no, what, you, no. You, you were nodding at me. <laughs> oh no, no, uh, Cindy, that was beautiful, and I, I, um, I just want to add, uh, capital planning is also um, a yes, very, very, five. very crucial um, committee to um, to talk to and keep informed of, and they're very much going to be a strong part of this process. Um, I just want to reiterate that we are do not want to make this decision in a closed room, and I think the meetings that we've had so far, I think, are indicative of that. Um, we very much want to look for ways to involve the community, and we're actually trying to think of different mm -hmm. ways to do that, and if people have ideas on that front, we'd love to hear them. So. Jeff? Uh, Mr. Thielman. You can call me Jeff. <laughs> I can, but uh, in, in the formal meeting, okay. I won't. Uh, so um, I uh, 
three of my, all three of my children have been in programs at the ACA, and I had a tour today with all tenants, and everybody showed up from the different uh, uh, places. So thanks very much for that. Um, <clears throat> you know, one thing that's, that's struck me over the past few weeks as, we've, um, as this conversation has started has been that <clears throat> I couldn't see myself supporting uh, a decision to take the Gibbs back to be an elementary school or a sixth grade or an eighth grade or whatever until there was a real concrete, solid uh, plan for the tenants uh, of, the, of, the, of that facility. And um, so, uh, you know, that, that's just where I stand. I, wanna, I would, I would want to see a really concrete, tangible, clear, detailed plan. Um, you know, the Arlington Center for the Arts has 150 performances uh, a year on the stage. And so someone floated the idea of uh, maybe those 150 performances could be uh, distributed around the district at different schools. Uh, I've run a school before and I can't imagine uh, having 150 performances at my school just to accommodate another group, an outside group. So I don't know, I think there's a lot of planning and discussion that has to take place. I wanna see a concrete plan uh, for the tenants uh, before any decision is made. And the question that keeps coming back to me is, did the decision that we made to put the uh, modular classrooms on the Stratton School make it more likely than not that we're going to have to take back the Gibbs? No. 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 no, not at all. Okay. Not at all. Okay. That's good to hear because that, that, that email is, I got an email about that. <laughs> so I wanted to clear that up. Okay, good. So, so I, mean, I think it's important to understand that we're, you know, this is one option. Um, I think we have to be creative. I like what Ted said. Um, I also think this is a community that has some resources, and uh, I'd like to see us look at a lot of different op a lot of different options, uh, in including you know looking at the possibility of building another school uh, because the town's gotten big enough to do that, or that the enrollment of the of the, po the student population has gotten big enough to start t at least having that conversation. So thank you. I want my title. No. <laughs> First off, I'd like to uh, state that I support everything that's been said uh, prior to this. We also have a space problem at the elementary level as well as the middle school level. Eighth grade is something that has been already talked about. It's not, I want us to measure 10 times before we even consider cutting. Uh, I have asked the chair to make a regular uh, agenda item for enrollment and space going forward until things are worked out. We need to get all the information before we make any kind of a decision. I agree with that. Um, we, Arlington, if, if we got a billion dollars given to us, that would not solve our problems. Space is just as much as money going down. Uh, the high school, um, it's, it's limited in what we're going to get from the state. Uh, God willing, we'll find out in December that we're on the list. At that point, it opens up some decisions. So that might give a little idea of the timeline. Once we know we're on the list uh, for MSBA list for the high school, we'll know that sometime in December. And that starts a feasibility study if we're fortunate enough to get that. Um, I don't have the answer for any of this. It's going to take all of us. And I agree with Ms. Starks and everyone else here. This has to be a community effort. The programs that you folks are involved in, a part of the community. The community won't be Arlington without you folks. That's a fact of life. I've been involved with Kelleher for a, in the background, uh, special needs for, my sister-in-law is 50 years old. Uh, my first experience with uh, Kelleher, I think she was uh, six in the program and stuff like that. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. <laughs> I can't be as eloquent as Ms. Starks, but I also feel strongly that we need a place for the arts and for all the other groups which are in the Gibbs Center. And I'm not, that's been well said here. I'm not gonna go into that further. I just, what I did wanna go into is just to reiterate that there's only one reason why we even consider or even put it as a possible one of many options looking at this, and that is that the schools are bursting at the seams. You parents in Thompson know this. 
There's people in the fifth grade who, class, who have classes, are in classes of 30, because there are no other classrooms to put the children in. There's no other room. The Hardy is not far behind. And that's going, that's, in a, that's happening in a lot of places in Arlington. The middle school is simmer, similarly bursting. I just finished having an eighth grader graduate last year, so I'm familiar with it. She had times when they couldn't have the health class in gym because there was no classroom that they could go have their class in. Um, they're that tight, and the building is not real amiable to ex easy expansion. So we're not looking at this because we're just going to do this because it's a whim or it, it's the easy thing. It's because we're really faced with very hard choices and we need to look at all of the options and then decide as a community which one works best. And I'm not saying that we should use the Gibbs or not. I'm saying that we have to be able to look at everything and think about it. And if we're too scared and too early, take something off the table, that doesn't do anyone a favor and it doesn't do our children who are in the schools a favor. So, yes, it's scary to think about. Yes, we need to think about what the fates are of all the organizations, but we need to be able to talk about things. And I hope we find a different solution, but I'm gonna want to talk about all the solutions. So bear with us as we go through this process. Any other members wish to speak? Then I'll exercise the chair's prerogative to be the last to speak. Um, I support the comments of all of my colleagues who are a, a wonderfully thoughtful group of people. Uh, I got off the school committee voluntarily in 2007. I didn't run for re-election and when there was a vacancy because somebody went to the dark side, they got elected the board of selectmen. Uh, I came back and, and ran for re-election a couple of times just because it is such an honor and privilege to serve with these people. They are just the finest group of public servants I've ever seen. And we are now facing one of the most difficult decisions we're going to have to make because there's a lot of moving parts. And yes, in, in a town government such as ours, there are lots of moving parts and we will do everything we can to keep everybody informed of all the moving parts and places where decisions will be made, including town meeting. And if you are not town meeting members and wish to become a town meeting member and have a vote on the floor of town meeting for any financial decisions that are being made towards this, the town clerk's office is on the other side of this hallway. You go down there, you obtain your nominating papers, you get the 10 signatures of people in your precinct, you get on the ballot, you join town meeting. How many people in, in here are town meeting members? I know Mr. Peluso is, we've got a couple, and I thank you for your service. It's important that people who care about the schools and care about the arts are also people who are making decisions on the floor of town meeting. It's a big part of this. Um, there, there are a lot of constraints that we have in, in Arlington. One is the total lack of vacant land. Um, uh, it makes it more of a challenge. If there were empty, big empty parcels around, we could be thinking more about expanding out to another location and moving programs. Um, cost is a factor and we might come up with an idea that would be a more expensive option than would be normally considered. And by that, I, you know, I, I, I want to point to the, the city of Barnstable. Uh, if you've ever been to Barnstable High School, uh, they have a wonderful performing arts center. We've driven down there to hear perf uh, performances. Uh, and they used uh, municipal money, they call themselves a town, but they're really a city. They use city money to go and add on to what the state was willing to fund for a high school in order to include a performing arts center within that facility. Uh, and it's a wonderful thing. Uh, and one thing that breaks my heart every time I go see a musical at Arlington High School is just how awful that facility is for any kind of performing arts. 
our kids deserve better, our community deserve, deserve, deserves better, and one of the goals of this high school rebuild in, in this duct tape high school that we have with no elevator, which is why we're here, um, is to have a performing arts area and a stage and an auditorium is worthy of the beautiful, wonderful programming that, that our students put forth every year. They deserve that kind of an experience. So how do we add to that? Maybe we add some arts functions there. That doesn't solve all the problems, but everything has to be on the table. Every idea's got to be out there. We've got to consider how do we meet the needs of our children who are in our K-12 system, as well as the needs of the community, because arts are vital to K-12 education, and arts are vital to the survival of the community. And if I don't say it, I'm in trouble going home because my wife is a classically trained uh, pianist and she teaches music at UMass Dartmouth. So uh, it is what it is. Um, we are with you and we want to find a great solution that preserves these valuable programs and meets the space needs of the children in our school system that is also something that is affordable and the residents of the town are willing to pay for. So the, those are the constraints that we have. And the more you are able to convince your friends and neighbors that this is something worth having and worth paying for, the better solution we can come up with, which is why I am so glad you're here, so glad you were here last time, so glad you have decided to become engaged in this process and uh, willing to present your ideas to us. And no matter what it is, I, I kidded with Mr. Palooza that we're not gonna build a new school in the swamp over at, uh, in East <laughs> Arlington, but any idea might generate the next idea, no matter how silly. So. Uh, silly ideas, good ideas, whatever it is, let's get them all on the table because we want your programs. We need to meet the needs of our kids. We want this to be an even better town in the future. So that's, that's where we're at. Thank you for coming. If, if we are going to the rest of our business meeting, which was, was going to start with a discussion of MCAS results. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Just like, I'd just like to mention, oh, hold on. I'd just like to mention the clerk's office is open right now if you want to go down and take out papers. I don't think you can pull papers yet, can you? Pardon me? Can you pull papers yet for town meeting? I don't think No, so. you can't. No, you're no, right. you can't. There's a date. Maybe a little too early. It's, it's Right. February or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, each of the organizations presented some informational packets for the committee. Can I? Oh, okay. Them? Thank you. Give them to uh, Karen. Uh, Karen, <laughs> and she will make sure we get them. Thank you. If you want to stay for the MCAS presentation, please do. We no. <laughs> Paul, Our children are so smart. We'll take about a couple of minutes recess just to allow people to uh, to leave. Yeah. Is there some place we can put all these ideas, like all the crazy ideas? Like, is there? Can we start like a Google Doc these, or something? These are from the like, uh, or or something? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. We should. Yeah. We should, yeah. we should just, yeah. just but that, throw that, up. Now we're deliberating, sorry, and we sorry. should deliberate within the context of the, okay. of the meeting where everybody can hear us. Yep. Okay. Chrome. <laughs> hmm? No, no. Yeah, so I'm supposed to because our schools are now. I don't know how to get rid of these They're things like, that open up. Yeah. Safari. It won't work. You get what doesn't work. I'm like, well, make it work. I know there's all these great things about Chrome, but I don't know how you said. I'm still doing. I've, I've gone to Firefox. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're going to Google Docs and some of that stuff, but Firefox is the only one that works for me. I just haven't gone to Chrome. I'm sure Chrome will, because it I is do a Chrome Google product, it will work I do with Chrome on my PC, stuff. but my Mac doesn't like it. Yeah, that's the problem. I think. The Firefox seems to happen. work okay. Firefox is more fr Mac friendly. Yeah. I Plus, see. to get to Munis, I have to go through Internet Explorer, God forbid. Nope. So, uh, yeah, I have no idea how to do it. I do yeah. Anything. yeah. <laughs> and I don't have no, I have no idea how to get into Word, either. I'm, I'm <coughs> very frustrated. I should just turn it down. Oh.
question. Yes. Here you can only have bottled water. Yeah. If this were the selectmen, Kevin Greeley would be passing out Dunkin' Donuts coffee and they'd be up till 3 a.m. Um, okay, fellow selectmen, here. <laughs> um, our next order of business, uh, Dr. Chesson will uh, present a brief analysis brief. on our parking and traffic issues of town. <laughs> Um, I, before I start, I want to just give you a brief introduction about how this is a very different um, metric this year. Um, last year, 500,000 students took the MCAS. This year, only 200,000 students took the MCAS, and that is because districts had the option to choose to take PARC or to take MCAS. And they were able to self-select, at least through their school committees. And so the reasons why someone might self-select to take MCAS versus PARC are as varied as the, the school districts. Mm -hmm. However, many of the metrics that we have used in the past compares ourselves to the state mm -hmm. um, in terms of things as simple as uh, the percentage of advanced or the percentage of proficient advanced, but also something like SGP, the student growth percentile, which per, um, compares students against the, their cohort, a cohort of students that have scored about in the same area. Um, but that cohort has significantly changed. So, Mr. Hill. I was just going to say, 10th grade hasn't changed, though, has it? Because every, everyone in the state 10th grade required. has not changed. That's so correct. So the, the figures they for the... They have no choice. They have no choice, right. I just want to be clear on that. Sure, thank you. Um, so, but the vast majority of the numbers that we would normally present are not here. Accountability, which we normally would present, levels where the school would be level one, two, or three, now is not going to be available until December. Mm -hmm. And the park results by district um, have just begun to come out, and the individual student results are not out yet. So you're going to see a much more shortened, uh, much shortened presentation than you would normally see, and many of the metrics that I would like to present to you, I don't have, and even the ones I have are a little bit questionable, I would say, or, or different than they've been in the past, not quite so much questionable. But we are gonna talk a little bit about the district results in ELA, and then math, science, and then talk a little bit about the plans for 2015, 2016, and we make those decisions primarily on the results that we get, and, I, and when we get to there, I wanna touch in, um, on our emphasis on data and to um, really point out to the committee um, the change that we were able to make in the school calendar this year where elementary has a Tuesday and what and what that means to it uh, let, let me just say as sure. a caveat because you know I play with this stuff for a living um, you're absolutely right and the frustrating thing for me is that we don't have accountability scores and a lot of what we do in terms of looking at this and lull is very much right. comparing the state results because this is sort of my specialty, there's about eight of us in the state who do meet regularly with the, uh, the data geeks at uh, DESE, and one of the things that we found out was that statistically, the differences between the park schools and the MCAS schools were, were, were very insignificant. You know, they, 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 they paired out, so there weren't any real differences, urban, rural, ethnically, Oh, you mean the, sc the schools that chose Park and yeah, the schools that chose that just So that you know, a lot of the comparisons that we'd be worried about going into it, uh, you have a, a smaller end by half, mm -hmm. so it makes it a little less stable. But the, the, there isn't really a significant difference between the populations <coughs> of the cohorts that were Park and MCAS. The demographics the of the demographics, populace. And, and in fact, past, act, uh, past performance on MCAS, because they've gone for that, because they need to weight this in order for the uh, accountability to line up evenly, because if one uh, cohort is different than the other, it, you, you're not able to make the comparisons mm -hmm. without making some sort of an adjustment. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that uh, having looked through your presentation, that I think you've been thoughtful and conservative, but I think that these are 
valid and important points to consider, and I thank you for that. So go ahead. Um, so here we have, um, we start off looking at the student growth percentile by grade in English language arts and math. Um, as the committee will remember, one of the school goals is to have an SGP mm -hmm. for in all subject areas for all grades to be 50 or better. Um, and as we look at our results from this year, with the exception of grade um, 10 ELA, which is just slightly below, and one could make an argument about whether that's statistically significant, certainly you could do a Z test and take a look. Um, but we are equal, equal to or better um, than uh, the goal that we set for ourselves. And then when we look at those um, breakdowns by school, so we look at elementary school SGP, um, again, for fourth grade and fifth grade, because we have to have something to compare it to, so we don't have anything to compare third grade to. Um, you'll see, again, some numbers in red. Um, and while those are things that we're looking at, I also want to point out um, the numbers, I think this, oh, good. Uh, some numbers that are really higher over the 50. And so one of the things that we're taking a look at is the schools um, that we'll be doing on Tuesday afternoons, the schools that have exceptional growth, what did those teachers do? I'm actually meeting with the, the two teachers that are involved in this at the Thompson School and the principal uh, next week to talk about what are the things that they did in their classroom that they believe might have contributed to this exceptional growth and can those things be replicated across other schools? Uh, so this is the overall district performance in ELA. Uh, normally, we would also have a state um, percentage A&P, CPI, and medium SGP. Um, again, I'm being very conservative as that because the full results are not out yet. Um, but as you look over time, we're pretty much uh, where we've been in terms of the percent of students that it, uh, um, advanced and proficient. And our SGP, again, across all, sub, uh, all grade levels for ELA is uh, meeting the 50 target. If we look at our per, uh, percentage at each uh, performance level over time, um, again, we see a slight increase in the students at advanced um, and uh, a pretty much the same number of students mm -hmm. at warning and, and failing. When we look at uh, the scoring advanced district versus state, now we've, we've always looked at this again. We, the N has significantly changed, and so um, we're only looking at um, a portion of the state. But if you look at the, that the average at grades three is uh, normally 15%. Last year we were pretty close to that. Um, if we look at the, the average at fourth grade is 15%. We were a little higher than that last year, and then right on the money for grades five. When we uh, look at grade six, again, the average was 16%. We were a little higher than that last year, um, right equal to our average uh, for grade seven and um, uh, a little bit higher than the average at grade eight. And finally, when we look at grade 10, where we do have all students all across the state taking the MCAS test, um, the difference between the state is, very, is, is exactly equal to what our percentage has been in the past. And if the committee would remember, last year we, uh, we did an analysis. We compared ourselves against other school districts. Um, since many of the, uh, or at least half of the other school districts that we normally compare ourselves to took park, we'll have to wait until those results come back. But if you remember from last year, we looked at all the, almost all the school districts that we compare ourselves to, and we saw that they also were sort of plateaued in their um, performance improvement, and we see the same thing happening again this year. Uh, so if I look at performance, again, by grade level, and again, what we look at is proficient and advanced because that's the target um, that gives us points towards our, um, uh, our level, our accountability level. Um, you'll see that the, we consistently have about the same width, um, but mm -hmm. so that means that we're about the same distance between the state for proficient and advanced when we compare ourselves. The same thing, again, you know, for grade four, you might see a couple percentage points up or down, but when we really look at the slope of the distance between the two lines, it's pretty much the same. And again, um, even though we went down, the state went down, so there's pretty much the same shape in grade five, in grade six, grade seven, grade eight, 
and grade 10. Um, and this is where, because of the competency requirement mm -hmm. for graduation, where we see almost all students across the state um, scoring pretty high. Um, in addition, uh, not only do students um, have to get a 240, but if they don't receive a 240, mm -hmm. but they actually pass the test, they're still, we're required to put together a performance plan to show how they would be work, continuing to work towards proficient for the remaining years in high school. Uh, again, this just tracks our percentage of students um, scoring advanced over the long haul. So let's talk about the analysis of what we see at the elementary level. Um, one of the things that we've seen is a real um, improvement in content um, scores and in construct scores or mechanic scores. Um, at the elementary level in certain schools. And again, as I said, we're gonna go into those schools and really talk to those teachers and find out what they, they did in the classroom. Um, what we really need to start doing is also seeing the same kinds of improvement in reading. Um, we have, as you're aware, we have adopted the uh, Lucy Calkins writing program um, several years ago for writing. Uh, we have a very robust program as we uh, get into that. Um, but now we're trying to art have the same clearly articulated program for reading. We have certain programs that we use for reading, but what exactly those units look like, daily lesson plans or weekly lesson plans for teachers are not currently available, were not currently available before this school year. We spent a lot of time this summer taking a look at that, and we will continue to take a look at that. Um, you've heard about, uh, uh, about the lab program in writing, um, and we think that that's beginning to have an effect. Um, we have expanded that program for this year, um, and um, the middle school, uh, grades six through eight, um, the training that they've had in Lucy Calkins is really starting to take um, effect. So looking, going on to mathematics, Again, we look at first our advanced and pro proficient percentage. Um, and as you see, it's pretty much stable to where it was last year if we look across the entire district. Um, and again, if we look at what our uh, SGP target of 50, <coughs> we're exceeding that. If we look at our uh, difference in our different performance levels over time, we have seen an increase um, in uh, the students that are scoring at the advanced level. We have a very kind of what we call stubborn or resistant population, and that doesn't mean that they're being difficult. It just means that that's a population that's very difficult um, to see an increase. Um, and I'll talk in a minute about how we're going to try to address that this year. Again, when we look at grade levels, we pretty much see the same level of dis uh, this same distance, the difference between the state and our um, scores of proficient and advanced at grade three. Um, we actually saw um, a widening of that at grade four. We're seeing pretty much the same. There's a little bit of an increase of the state at grade five. Grade six is pretty much the same. Grade seven, we saw some improvement in the difference between the state and uh, the district some improvement uh, from the state in grade eight. And again, um, we're seeing significant, uh, continued significant difference um, in math. So what's the important things that I want you to know about math this year? We had 36 total students in grades three through five that scored warning, which is the lowest level at all schools. Only 36 students out of all our elementary school students. We think that's pretty significant. And of those, 81% of those students were scoring in the 216 to 218 level, which means that they're very close to um, the bandwidth for needs improvement. Um, there were no students in the low warning, in the very low scoring of, the, of warning. All our elementary school students that were in warning were within three questions of scoring needs improvement, and that's pretty significant. Um, we have an area of focus for PD for grades three through five, um, in, is, is the connection to high need students. And that's what we saw at the beginning, that 6% that almost are consistently scoring warning. Now they're moving up through the warning levels, so that the same 6% is there, but instead of them being at the bottom of warning, they're moving to the top of warning. And so the professional development that we're gonna focus on this year 
is working with the math coaches, the classroom teacher, and the special education teachers, and the ELL teachers for those high need students to really make sure that they're getting a double dose. So that's what's happening in pull out and what's happening in the classroom build upon one another. The growth of content knowledge for high need students at the middle school is growing so significantly that students who are low warning are still able to access content which is at grade level. So what this means is in the past, the students would come out of the middle school, and if they were, I'm sorry, out of the elementary school, and if they were high needs going into, into middle school, those teachers were not able to teach sixth grade math content. They were having to teach fifth grade or upper fourth grade math content for where to start. We've seen such improvement in the, in the elementary schools that this year the sixth grade high needs teachers are able to te begin to teach sixth grade content. And we're going to take that um, even to a uh, more granularity by looking at what part of sixth grade they're working at and how much of sixth grade they get through. Um, and the number of six students recommended for math support in sixth grade is decreasing, even though, as we well know, the number of students at the middle school is increasing. We also have a number of students that have chosen in eighth grade to actually um, decline math support this year um, because they feel confident enough to do their math curriculum without that, and we're going to track the success of those students. And moving on to science and technology. Um, again, we see that we um, almost consistently have the difference between us and the state be about the same. Sometimes this goes up a little bit, down a little bit, but pretty much about the same. Uh, the same thing at grade 8, if you remember, science is only offered in 5, 8, and 10. And then again, um, in grade 10, the difference is pretty much the same. Um, one of the things I do want to call to your attention to, particularly at grades 8 and grades 5, um, our difference, our improvement, or our difference better than the state is more significant in science than in almost any other subject area. Um, as you have heard, the committee has heard earlier, we have, uh, last year I believe, that we have a science and technology program at the middle school that was picked as one of the um, exemplars for the state. And the percent of students scoring in advance at the high school has increased. Um, and the focus on math and ELA at the elementary may have resulted in what we consider to be a fairly static um, performance in science. Um, there's only so many hours during the school day, and we're really focusing on trying to get those um, ELA and math achievement up. And so um, we are, uh, we may have, got, as a result, gotten some static performance in science. Um, so we want to look at our subgroups uh, and our high need students. You'll see the percent um, that are reaching proficiency. Um, the uh, light blue line is the high need students. The darker purple line is the non-high need students. And the um, white is the all students. Now, one of the things that we notice here is that even though there's some variation here, there's much more significant difference between the high need students and the non-high need students in the earlier grades than there is when we get to high school. Um, so basically, when we look at students, and even when we look at DRA scores, we find that when, which is our reading scores, we find that when students get to fifth grade, the vast majority of the students start to make the benchmark. The problem with that is it takes us to the third, fourth, and fifth grade level to get them to the benchmark. And then when they get into high, when they get into middle school, the same thing. It takes us sixth, seventh, and eighth grade to get them to the benchmark. So we're addressing our, uh, our efforts to try to get them to the benchmark sooner. Um, because what happens, particularly at the elementary school, is that um, students will be meeting, meeting the reading benchmark for the vast majority of them by the time they get to fifth grade, but they spent third, fourth, and fifth grade working towards that benchmark <coughs> as opposed to using reading skills to learning content. So we, we want to make sure that we can try to get students to benchmark sooner. Again, when we look at math, um, we see that, again, there's a difference, you know, um, in the um, high need, between the high needs and the, uh, the non-high needs, um, but yet less of a difference when they get up to the um, 10th grade level. So what lies ahead for us? 
Um, thanks to the committee support, we were able to change the elementary schedule and we have much more regular schedule for data meetings, uh, data team meetings. And again, that has allowed us to really look at what is tracking to our ELA scores. Is it write, our writing scores or is it our reading scores? If our writing scores are helping us to gain improvement, which schools are gaining the improvement, and to really working with those schools to replicate what they're doing at other schools. We have been including math, science, attendance, and discipline data in review by the teams. Um, we have a wider review of common assessment data. The curriculum directors are really focusing on this year, and we'll be coming back to the committee in each subject area to show you the different measures, because MCAS is just one measure, and MCAS in many ways does not measure all the things that we want for our children. Uh, it doesn't me measure their ability to problem solve what we call non-regular problems. It doesn't measure their ability to work collaboratively. Um, there are many things that we have as goals for our students that are not measured by the MCAS, and we're going to start presenting to those to you on a regular basis. Uh, we've had, as we've said, we have a significant increase in time for teachers to work together and also teachers of different disciplines. So the regular classroom teacher and the EL teacher, ELL teacher, the regular classroom teacher and the SPED teacher, and we're already starting to get some traction from that. Um, we have a development of a district-wide curriculum team that we'll meet for the first time next week where we have representatives from each grade level in math, uh, science and ELA to start really talking about where we can get those two firsts across the curriculum because the elementary school day is not getting any longer and the elementary teachers are having to cover more. Uh, we've talked about the expansion of the lab program in writing. Um, we've expanded our PD um, in math and grades K through three, particularly in kindergarten, which was implementing tools in the mind, as you know, and we haven't been able to work with them as much in math over the last couple of years and we're really focusing on that. And uh, FOSS is our um, full option science system, and that is a science, hands-on, inquiry-based science curriculum that's much more in line with the next generation science standards. We're implementing one of those units at um, the, each of the grade levels this year, and we'll be expanding that next year. Okay, Dr. S uh, Mr. Thielman. So I had a question on slide four, uh, Laura. You so it had elementary SGP by school. There were several school, there were several grades and, well, you had, you had fourth and fifth grade SGP. So there, there are several schools that. I'm going, I'll get there. Yeah, that are below 50. So what. The, that slide right there? Yeah, so what, you know, what happened and, and what are you doing? For example, Thompson, fourth grade 38. ELA 31.5, well, where they have an 82.5. Well, if so this what, is 82.5 and this is 38, yeah. I mean, I'm meeting with those teachers to ask a lot of questions. I think it would be reasonable to say, spend a lot of time on ELA, maybe not as much time on math. Yeah, okay. Uh, but I don't want to accuse anybody, or right. not accuse, but I don't want to make a conjecture until I meet with those teachers. So you, next so you week. haven't done sort of the, a deep dive yet on those numbers um, with the staff? On the specific ones, no. On, again, on this one, I happen to know that they spent a lot of time on math based on their math results from the previous year. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing that that has something to do with that. Um, Brackett is a very high performing school and at times you will start to see a plateauing and so you don't see the same level of growth. Again, remember these numbers are based on a cohort that's not exactly the same as the cohort it was last year because it's, it's a comparison of students to a cohort of students, but some of those students may have taken park, so they may not be in this cohort anymore. As a matter of fact, one of the problems that we found is that I ran reports from the state from two different places and got different SGP numbers because uh, the N was different. Um, so, but, it's, so the, but the SGP, just to clarify, is fourth grade to fifth grade, They're, and then third to fourth. It's, uh, yes, it's fourth yeah. grade to fifth grade, but, yeah. you, but it compares not those specific students, oh, but I those see. specific students against a cohort of students across the state that scored about the same as them over a period of time. Yeah. And, and where their growth looks in comparison to that. If that cohort changes, then the number is slightly, could be slightly off. Okay, and the other question I have is just a general question on, we're, we're expecting a decision on park at some point in the next? November. In the month, right, in November. Um, so could you just sort of lay out for the community that what, what 
you know, what's at stake and what all that might mean so people have a sense of that? Um, well, we, the committee saw a, a communication plan, um, a uh, PD plan, and um, a, a schedule, a possible schedule for a draft schedule for PARC if the, if the State Board of Education does choose to go with that. Um, I think that's probably a coin toss at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, but we have that in place, and as soon as that decision would be made, if the decision to go with park was made, we would roll. We have those plans all in place, and we would just we would roll them out. And if this, well, we don't know what this, we don't know what the vote's going to be of the board of education. And if the vote is to stay the course with MCAS, we're we're prepared we're, to do that. as so well. So we're ready either way. Yes. That's what I wanted to clarify. Thank you, uh, Dr. Seuss. Um, yeah, I just have a question about slide seven. So that was. Um, uh, the ELA performance over time, and we saw a this one. A, yeah, we just we saw some analysis of a similar slide in, on math, where we know that only six percent are warning, and you told us a little bit about what that meant and how they weren't quite as low as they used to be. And I was just wondering, do we have sort of a similar analysis going on with ELA? Um, it's it's about the same, where students are moving into the high areas of warning. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is what we call a resistant population. It's, it's, is that about 5 to 6%? Is it, yes, it's okay. about the same percentage, okay. yeah. It's actually a little bit less than that, mm -hmm. um, just eyeballing it. OK. okay. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Um, on the slides that you uh, use for the math on, uh, on grade level and proficiency in advance, I pulled the numbers that you did, and consistently there's been a drop from sixth grade to seventh grade and then an uptick to eighth grade yep. with one exception. This has been an issue we've been talking about almost every single year. It's dropped a little bit, I understand, but we, we've talked about programs, we've talked about uh, We've got a new math person, and I, I, I should have prefaced all this. I want to commend you and everyone else that's done this. It's great work and stuff. But I'm still concerned mm -hmm. with this, this drop and then uptick again, uh, from 6 down to 7, then up to 8 again. Mm -hmm. So I Well, that's down also actually um, across the state. Um, the same thing happens in, um, in ELA. Uh, that students, um, especially if s school districts that don't have solid writing programs, will sometimes see a drop in their scores in fourth grade and then go back up in fifth grade. Um, so I I'm not saying that that's acceptable. What I'm saying is that we have, this is only our third year on the math curriculum, so we only had two years worth of the math curriculum. Um, and uh, I feel like we're continuing to make progress, but not perhaps not as quickly as we would like. This, this stands out from 2007 yep. all the way up to 2015, yep. with one exception. Uh, it, it, it's a steady patent. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you and your staff have done a lot of work in it, but there's still an issue there. Yep. And, that I, and one I would particular... agree that that's still the same thing okay. as here. It's, still, well, it's, it's something that's very difficult to change, but we're not accepting that, and we're continuing you. to work on it. Uh, Dr. Allison, have you? Um, I had two questions. First, sure. is there going to be another MCAS pre yes, presentation Yes, when we get all letter? the PARC results, we'll, we'll do another presentation because we'll have the accountability results in December. Okay. Um, and second, um, I'm now, I'd like to look at the last few slides on 40 and... Um, in science? The science yeah, slides? It's a, no, it's the um, high needs versus non-high needs, way at the end of the presentation. Sure. Hmm. So my question is, what is the churn of high need students in our district? That's a good question. And how much of that, you know, because I'm thinking, you know, you're thinking about mm -hmm. what are they learning, but if we have a whole bunch of students coming in, we haven't taught them before, but they can still have a, a growth score calculated, I think because if they, if they were in Massachusetts prior to yeah, coming to yeah. us yeah and and so I'm wondering I'd like to know just sure. for understanding our numbers better um, so you, you're asking for the turnover of yes. how many high need students are new going in and out or just coming into the district later in their career going going in and out I mean just having okay. some idea because we're you know some of the numbers that we're looking at we didn't actually teach them the last year or, or stuff. right uh, so, correct. I, I'll have to. That that's going to take some doing, but I, okay. I I think that is a very interesting thing to ask, and I will take a look at it. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Starks. I have no questions at this time. Um, I, I 
look at the seventh. Yeah, I, I have a different view of the seventh grade. You know, the thing is that some years, some tests are harder than others. And on the ELA side, the fourth grade ELA test is statistically right. the hardest. Hardest, yes. Uh, because you can, you, you can actually track it by looking at the growth scores. Because if the growth scores are high and the score, the actual uh, scaled score went down, you know, you're also running against a difficulty to test. And this year, our seventh grade math growth score was at 54, which is a very strong growth score. So, you know, we, we've had movement. Uh, I, I don't know that, that, that it's raising to the level of, of concern in my mind. I, I think that, th that this year's uh, set of scores just on the uh, outset are, are very strong, and I'm very grateful for the teachers of Arlington who have worked hard in terms of providing a, a good, solid education to children, not t teaching to test, but because good instruction yields uh, uh, reasonable results, I think that that we have a lot to be proud of. Thank you. Uh, and, and I would like to jump on that for one second. Um, I had a conversation with the math director about that today, and that's why I think it's so important for us to come in and present some other metrics to you, because we do not teach the test. As a matter of fact, we cut out the um, after school because it, we really felt like we were not getting an impact from it, the after school mm -hmm. um, MCAS program, and mm -hmm. put that work during the day, mm -hmm. but really work at trying to get children to be able to persevere, mm -hmm. to solve non-regular problems, and we really feel that w with that, over time, we will get better results, plus we will get students that have other skills that will serve them better in life. I think I saw Mr. Hainer's hand I, I was just going to uh, ask the phenomenal scores at the 10th grade. Is that the incentive to graduate? Um, it, it also there is also probably a widely accepted view that that's probably the, one of the um, least rigorous tests because it's based on um, standards that many students have surpassed by the 10th grade. What those that don't pass it uh, is the, is the remedial programs? Or do they just take another uh, math course, or do they? Well, we, they, we, they have two we, more years Actually, to the vast majority of our students take four years of math, whether they okay. pass the MCAS or not. That's something that we've seen a significant increase in over the last three years since Mr. Coleman took over as math director um, and since we began to expand our offerings um, to uh, students. But um, the students are required to continue to take math classes until such time as they demonstrate proficiency. Arlington is um, a very strong track record. We have not had a student who has not been able to graduate because they have not passed the math exam. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Spiegel, you're on for a diversity report. Thank you. Did you say thank you. The report should be, it's on the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. The report's in the, uh, the report's on the agenda. It's in, in Nova, so. In okay, I think. That's fine. Ms. Fitzgerald's going to put it up and yeah. move over a little. So. I don't have it. Oh, do you want me to? It's on Novus. Do you want me to link to my? Oh, I can get it. Oh, here it is. Do you want me to? Um, just, um, I can put my laptop on there if you want it. Um, it it'll yeah. do this. Thank you. Um, so the report from this year, what it shows is the number of previous hires that we've retained from 2015. The time period that this covers is October 1st, 2014 through September 30th, 2015. So a lot of uh, the bulk of the new hires were new hires for this school year, but there were a, quite a few who were hired between October 1st and the end of the school year 
and some for summer employment as well. The new hires um, include, um, and the previous hires also, include substitute teachers, community education mm -hmm. teachers, Arlington after school teachers, so, and, and as well as our regular classroom teachers and teaching assistants and all professional staff in the district. What this shows is at the beginning of, as of October 1, 2014, we retained the previous hires in each category, Asian, Black, Hispanic, Native American, White, and then ones who were not, were not self-identified. And then the uh, numbers uh, of new hires that we added after October 1, 2014 till September 30th, 2015 in the various categories, Asian, Black, Hispanic, Native American, White, and not self-identified. Um, one thing to explain, the number of new hires seems large overall because that does include all the new substitutes. We have made a concerted effort and um, Ms. Foley may see that there's still some days where there's not enough substitutes in the schools and we are still working on that, but we are trying to bring in new subs um, continuously through the school year. That is one area of, that we're addressing and so um, there's a lot of turnover and churn in the substitutes. Um, we've all, that also includes a lot of uh, community education, Arlington After School, as I said, and new teaching assistants where we have a lot of uh, turnover among our teaching assistant staff. I think overall the report shows we've, we have, I think, met the goal as defined by the school committee's goals in terms of diversity hiring and going above the baseline from last year because if you go, um, oh, let me scroll down. Total staff in each category is is higher, but so I mean I th overall I think we met the goal as outlined by the school committee's goals. However, I think we still have a lot of work to do. Among the w the goal to diversify our teaching staff, the staff that is in front of students on a daily basis in the schools, um, we've done a little bit. We've done some some good for that. I think. Um, one program that I think has done very well is the Arlington After School program, both at Hardy, Thompson, and Audison. They have been able to attract a more diverse workforce, um, which helps. I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of students in our district who take advantage of those programs. Um, we have, in our professional staff, um, been able to hire some new new staff this year um, in the in our data department. And one of our new uh, directors of social studies um, is an Asian man, and so we have done, we have had some, some good hires. They're great people, they're great hires, and um, they do meet the goal of diversifying. We do still have some work to do, I think, especially in the classroom teaching role. We do not have the diversity of staff that we would like and we're still working on that and it's a, an ongoing goal to increase that um, the diversity of that of the teaching staff and teaching assistant staff. Um, we did lose some staff who we didn't retain this year because of various reasons. They went back to school or went to other jobs. Um, teaching assistants, we still have an issue with retaining teaching assistants. What, part of that is our salary. Part of it is the nature of the position tends to be a starting point for people looking to become teachers and if they are, if there isn't a position that they fit in here they'll look elsewhere so there's a, a, several reasons for that um, but we I, you know we stress this as a goal to the principals and the hiring administrators continuously throughout the year to um, to work and I, I can I, the other thing I'll note and it's not an excuse but this is a statewide issue in terms of having <clears throat> difficulty expanding the diversity of the teaching force to reflect the students that we deal with and see an, on a daily basis. The city of Boston, Boston Public Schools, has had some well-publicized 
um, articles in, in the Globe that they're having difficulty because they've had a lot of teachers retire and they haven't been able to replace them. And mm -hmm. so we're competing with the city of Boston and Cambridge and, and other suburban districts. And it's, it's a challenge, but we continue to, to work and improve. Uh, okay, down the list, Ms. Starks. Um, one question I have, um, I was just doing some quick percentage math, um, is I think that what a really good goal would be would be at, try to at least meet or have the same percentage on staff as we have in students. Um, and so one question I have is do we have the numbers of the percent um, of Students. diverse student body that we have. I mean, that would be interesting to me to make, to kind of see it yes. that way. I mean, I realize So that, we you know, do have those numbers. I don't have them in right, the slide. Right, I could right, right. Yeah, yeah. Them. No, but if we could get those up. And my I, interest is trying to see if we can at least try to line those up a little bit. Sure. So if we have those, if you could share them sometime. Dr. Allison yeah. Ampey. Um, just a second. I lost my page. Um, I wanted to commend you. Um, so I was tinkering with these at home, and I just want to point out for our audience at home that we went from a, from a total of 66 pe people of diverse backgrounds in 2014 to a total of 79 in 2015, which is a substantial increase. And that's even though we increased our total staff also, we still, the percentage went from 5.4% up to 5.8%. Um, in terms of people of diverse backgrounds. So both of those are nice jumps. Mm -hmm. And I recognize it's in the face of large competition for um, hiring and stuff. So thank you. Thank you. Dr. Seuss. Yeah, I was actually also going to point out the percentage jump, which um, is small, but it's progress. And mm -hmm. we commend you for that. Um, we recognize that this is a very difficult problem. Um, we also think that it's very important to always keep it in the forefront of our policy goals, and mm -hmm. I think that we're doing that. So, Mr. Yeah. Hainer. Uh, you mentioned uh, hiring substitutes. Are they employees of the district? It, substitutes are employees of the district because... They, okay, we're no longer using ASOP? We are using ASOP, but that they are employees in that they get a paycheck from us, they are on our payroll, they get a W-2 or uh, at the end, um, so, and they have to be fingerprinted and quarried and everything. So yes, they are our employees, but they are, they are temporary. They're, they're sort of per diem as needed employees. Okay, then uh, let me just add this. If I was a substitute, I'm going through the ASOP system, am I, am I correct? Yes. Not to, we, okay. Well, Thank you me. come, well, there's, substitutes are hired through my office. Okay. I, I meet with all the substitutes, right. or Kelly Piggott in my right. office will meet with new substitutes, people who are interested in substitute teaching in our district. We're interviewing them, we're checking their references, but then we put them into the ASOP system and then they can take jobs through mm -hmm. that okay. system. They don't collect unemployment during the summer. They do not collect unemployment during the summer if we give them a reasonable assurance that they have a job as a substitute in the next school year. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. So I want to commend the district for the increase in the number of people of color that have been hired. And the other thing is just to understand that this is a, it's a pipeline issue in education. It is. It's a, it's a, the challenge is getting people who are in, people, young people of color in high school and in college to think about a career in education. So the extent, to the extent that which to which we can get involved in addressing the pipeline question, uh, we can help solve the problem over the long term. It is a pipeline question, and I think the schools of education are well aware of that and are doing, <laughs> taking steps to try to address that situation as well. Any other members? Hearing none. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is <coughs> superintendent's evaluation. Uh, <clears throat> the question has come up. Uh, is exactly uh, what the procedure and what the role of various subcommittees are uh, with regard to the superintendent's evaluation as we prepare to meet our obligation. One of my frustrations is that the state has failed to give us accountability data at the, in a timely manner, and that's one of the things that we count on getting in September to think about uh, uh, the evaluation of superintendent, yet there are certainly regulations that we need to follow 
to align with the statewide educator evaluation protocol. So right now I'm going to open this up. I know a couple of members want to talk on this, so I'm going to open it up to the board uh, to engage in a conversation about our next steps and where we're going to go. With the, with, you know, um, who would like to go first? Mr. Thielman? Uh, thank you. I hadn't raised my hand yet, but good, good. Well, we've got to get it started somehow. Okay, great. Uh, so first of all, I just want to make sure we're clear on the timeline. When are we to complete the evaluation, get it to the chair? What's the deadline to get something to you, Paul? Um, uh, do you have the policy yet, Mr. Hainer? The, what we tried to get together and agree with last year is that we would be submitting our individual evaluations to the chair by the second meeting in October. Okay. But if I may? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, let me. I, I agree okay. with the, the chair that but one of the elements, because we moved, normally an evaluation would be done at the end of a school year. This committee uh, wanted the accountability data and things of that nature. Uh, available to us. That's why we moved it to November. Mm -hmm. Now, that, as the chair said, <laughs> we normally we have it by now, mm -hmm. and we don't have that. So I don't know where we're going to go with that. So here's, I just want to make this, this is a point I was mm -hmm. thinking about the other day, is uh, this is a little history on this uh, process. We, uh, years and years ago, we amended the uh, Curriculum and Instruction and Assessment Committee to be the Curriculum, Instruction, Assessment, and Accountability Committee and specifically to monitor the superintendent evaluation process. Then the state changed the law, or the, 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 the regulation, whatever they changed. The DESE changed its rules. And so when DESE changed its rules, we set up a specific set superintendent evaluation subcommittee to make sure that we were in compliance. And the thinking, I think, which was a good decision, mm -hmm. and I think the thinking behind that decision was at some point that subcommittee would go away and then the Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Subcommittee would, as part of its regular charge, monitor, manage this process, meaning that that committee would meet in November, December, January, February, and come up with a plan, be clear on directing the superintendent about what evidence we needed, uh, be clear on timelines, so that when we got to the fall, we, could, we had a plan in place. Mm -hmm. So what, what I think what's happened here is that we forgot about kind of shifting everything from the superintendent evaluation subcommittee to the curriculum instruction assessment subcommittee so that we could plan the process better. And I think what we, the best thing we can do at this point, because we're, this is due next week, the next meeting rather, in two weeks, these are, our, our, our sentiments on the, on the uh, superintendent's performance are due next week or two weeks from now. Um, <clears throat> the best thing we can do is charge the curriculum instruction assessment subcommittee with getting a plan in place for next year. I think at this point, and I think that the, the, the superintendent evaluation subcommittee needs to kind of go away because its charge is over. We are in compliance. We're in compliance to the best of our capacity with state regulation. Mr. Hainer. I would agree with that 100%. Uh, the one thing that's most important is the, the, the suggested months of, of that planning, the initial planning, I would hold to that. Yeah, I, I agree. think that's very important just for the superintendent uh, to, to know where, what we're expecting uh, in, in performance. And I would just add specific dates throughout the year yeah. for check-in. That's all. I agree. Yeah. I mean, so I don't even know if it's, I, I don't even know if the well, uh, evaluation subcommittee I just want to add, I was surprised that the, I thought the evaluation committee was going to end a year ago last June. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, we kept it going again. Uh, I, I agree with uh, you 100%. Yeah. So, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm, do we need, need a motion? Take, I'll, I'll, what do we do? I saw. I, mean, I, 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 I didn't. Do we you need you take, can make a motion to dissolve the superintendent evaluation subcommittee and move the uh, work back to CIAA. So moved. Second. Uh, CIAA curriculum instruction assessment and accountability. Uh, we have a motion by Mr. Thielman, second by Mr. Hainer on the motion. Any uh, debate or discussion? Hearing none, uh, it's time for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous vote, 6 nothing. Uh, the evaluations by the policy are due by the next meeting. Uh, Mr. Hainer. I would, 
I have something to report. Do you want me to wait till uh, the uh, with, that with, well the committee doesn't exist anymore to report. So. Well, you, well, you you can report out anyway. Okay, I'll report out uh, then. because you're Fine. reporting history. Even though we abolished okay. the committee, there, there things happen. Fine. and We can talk about it. Fine, I'll wait till then. You want me to do well, it now? You can do it now. We're okay. on the topic. The uh, one of the things we did this year that's slightly different is we we set up a survey for uh, administrative staff. A lot of bumps in, uh, in it. I apologize for that. Uh, Mr. Good did a phenomenal job doing it. Uh, I have it. Uh, I'm not, this is not for public consumption because I'm just reporting that it is available. Uh, when we deal with it, then it will become uh, a public document. I have it a paper form, but I also have it electronically. Mm -hmm. uh, I've shared it with a couple of members already electronically. Those that want it either way, just let me know. Uh, I will prepare it. It is uh, 49 questions. Mm -hmm. um, there were 35 people initially uh, were invited to participate. They had to drop one because that one of the uh, uh, invitees was, uh, resigned. <coughs> so out of 34 uh, potential, uh, 21 responded. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. I, at my request, I asked Mr. Good to extend it one more week with, uh, mm -hmm. to everyone and uh, sent out uh, an, a reminder and he got uh, several more people. Mm -hmm. This will be available to you in either form. Just let me know by the end of the night. I, okay. I definitely would like it. I think we all should get no, it. No, I mean, yeah. you want, we're, we're, whether we'll it's paper, it after paper or electronic, either way. Uh, we'll give it out after the meeting, which will mean I, it'll be available in the, uh, at the next, uh, it'll be publicly available yes. attached to the superintendent's evaluation right. at the next meeting. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey, by the way, was very kind to go and download the evidence and arrange them in folders so that if uh, any member of the committee wants it, just pass the uh, thumb drive over to them and you can stick it in your computer and, and, and work with it that way. Dr. Allison yeah. Ampey. Oh, just to be clear, all I was doing was organizing. I'm not, I haven't changed anything mm -hmm. except to make it easier to find what goes where. Um, so what do we do if when we're looking at the evidence for the goals we have questions about it either we feel we don't understand how it applies or mm -hmm. we think it doesn't if there's questions where we feel there's more substance needed what do we do you you certainly have the option of uh, inquiring back to the superintendent or the assistant superintendent who's also qualified to answer those questions because, you know, the data is you know, standard district data that, that, I, that I'm sure that the assistant superintendent can answer. If there are personnel issues that are m a little more technical, um, the uh, HR director would be able to respond to you. You can also uh, extend queries to the chair. Should I extend all? Okay, I'm not saying I have them. I'm, I'm, this is, I'm doing this in case anyone here has mm -hmm. them. Um, do we all extend all inquiries through the chair? Uh, no, or do I, we go I, straight? I would not, you know, the thing is, if it, that, that's And, and then, no, then the, my the other question, question really is that, no, you should communicate individually on your concerns. And if there is something that the person you query from deems um, important for the whole committee to see, like if there was an error in some of the data or there was a technical mm -hmm. thing, and they communicate back to us, they'd be creating a public document. So, uh, you know, the, there is a certain amount, amount of discretion in terms of the level of questioning that you're going through. Uh, how do I fill out the form? question is obviously mundane and not worthy of uh, communication to the rest of the committee. But if you run into something and you're looking at some piece of data which has, uh, which would impact the, the rest of the committee's ability to do the evaluation, I would ask that that be communicated back to the uh, full committee and to, uh, to Karen Fitzgerald so that the public document is preserved. Mr. Hainer. I think technical issues, things that are in, uh, wrong, errors and things like that, I have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. But this data is, is data in support of go a goal mm -hmm. for the evaluatee, the superintendent. I'm not trying to dump it all on the superintendent or anything, but I, I, I would be adverse to someone else making a judgment about what I feel is an important piece of data. 
So, I mean, s specific data and stuff like that, if I, a clarification or if I don't feel that it's appropriate or whatever, I feel a responsibility to go to the superintendent and not to other people, even though it, it, one of the pieces of data was this presentation tonight mm -hmm. uh, in, in, to achieve a goal. Although Dr. Chesson presented it, Dr. Bodie put it in as a piece of evidence. If I have a question about that, I feel it's important. She may direct me to Dr. Chesson, but I think it, it's my responsibility to go to her first if I have questions about things of it's, that nature. It seems to me the only the only thing that I would point out is, is that you know th you know factual information. There there's a lot of things that are non-controversial or non-interpretive. So that if you're asking, say, how many kids were in the seventh grade, whatever, that, that's, that's tied to it, that, that could be, no be that. spread anywhere yeah. out. Yeah. And don't forget, if you as a member feel it's something that the rest of the board should see, you have the ability to forward it to our administrative secretary, who will then forward it to the rest of the committee. So everybody, be it staff members or individual committee members, who, who un uncover something or see something that should be brought to the attention of the rest of the committee can pass it through Karen Fitzgerald so it gets back to the rest of us. We want this to be an open, transparent process because the most important th one of the most important things we do is evaluate the superintendent and that by law needs to be a public pro uh, process and by law the documents uh, attached to it and supporting it are public documents including everything we write and present at the next meeting. Mr. Hayner. Excuse me, we're not presenting at the next meeting, we're giving we're it to you by that time. It the next yeah. It's in November. And, and then presenting, it, the, doing the final presentation in November. So you're giving it to me in the next meeting. Right. Uh, but you know, it, it, at the presentation, it becomes a public document. Correct. Uh, I'm running the meeting, uh, losing track of my time. Any other questions, comments on the topic of superintendent evaluation? Hearing none, next item on the agenda is I do just a, go ahead. I'm sorry. The format we're supposed to use, we have that. Do we have that? Do we have that, Karen? Have we distributed the uh, evaluation tool to the members? Uh, let's do that. I assume it's, it's the same. It's the same as last year. SE document we used last year. Let's make sure yeah. that uh, just every member it? Gets, yeah. gets an email to them so they can download it and work off of it. Thank you very much. Because that would be an electronic document we'd want to manipulate because I want uh, electronic documents from everyone. Um, anything else? No. Hearing none. Um, uh, policy BEDB, Agenda for uh, Format Preparation and Dissemination. Um, well, the chair got a little reactive <laughs> on Tuesday. Um, and Mr. Hayner said, can we put something on the agenda? And I said, no, it's too late, the last minute, blah, blah. The, then I went back and read the policy and said it wasn't too late. And I went back to, to Mr. Hayner and said, I'm sorry, uh, we can put this on the agenda. Because I'm thinking that uh, the, the notice for, for meetings is longer and probably should be, at least to my way of mind. I was about to throw a, uh, a fit because we didn't have financial reports and it was within the deadline. So. Um, uh, my fault, but I think that there's a valid point. So I went on the MASC listserv, and, uh, and, and anyone can go back on there and look at what the responses are and did a quick poll of what the uh, lead time is for agenda items being uh, finalized and published uh, either on paper distributed as packet items or uh, posted electronically in the um, uh, in a device such as Novus that we're using. Um, and the other thing that's going about is that when we originally set up the policy, we were unsure of the software we were using, and we took a conservative approach that we would open the support documentation to the public at the time of the meeting. The selectmen do it at the time of the formal distribution, which would be a couple of days earlier. Um, having seen the way the product works, I, I think that we might want to revisit that as well. So for all those reasons, I, I think that having a meeting on a Thursday, getting stuff on a Tuesday night, which is the 48 hours that are required under the policy, uh, 
it is, it's tough for us to really thoughtfully digest some of the material that we have. Uh, and I, I'd like to uh, improve our transparency and get the information out to the public earlier, because now that we are a little more familiar with using the tool that at, at that public distribution point, let the public see what we're looking at and what we're thinking about. So I'd like to uh, ask the uh, Policies and Procedures Committee to take a look at uh, Policy BEDB, Agenda Format Preparation Dissemination, and come back. Dr. Allison Ampey. Mr. Pierce has asked me to stand in for policy since he was unable to be here for tonight. So as such, I accept and we will do that. Mr. Hainer. Uh, I agree with the chair and everything. I took no offense from the chair. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't hear anything uh, in your tone. Uh, what, I'd, what I think I heard is that as far as documentation that's coming, even if there's an agenda item, mm -hmm. documentation stuff, mm -hmm. unless it's an emergency thing, mm -hmm. if it isn't provided, it doesn't show up at that meeting. Right. I mean, and that I, I appreciate everyone having to work very hard and getting things in time and stuff. But as, as the chair said, when do we get it in a timely manner? We have a chance to digest it, and we're, we're far more efficient. Mm -hmm. And that, that shows. When I first came on the board, it was no meetings were three, three and a half hours long. Mm -hmm. Right now, a long meeting is two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because of the efficiency that we have established uh, among ourselves and with the support of the administration and everything. So I would, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm I'm going to suggest that to the policy uh, committee when they go forward. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think one of the successes of this committee is that we operate under a no surprises rule and that we don't put things on the table at the night of the meeting. Um, that's, that's very important. I think that it builds collegiality and it uh, gives everybody an equal shot at it. And, uh, and I think the community's got a right to, to see what we're thinking about as well before we talk about it. So th these, are, these are important things. and I. I thank the uh, committee for uh, supporting that, and I hope that the uh, Policies and Procedures Committee will um, look at this and make some adjustments. Any other conversation on this agenda item? We are now to monthly financial reports. Um, Ms. Johnson. I do have a presentation in here. We have a presentation. Uh -huh. Yes, that is a PowerPoint. Uh -huh. and the last item is PowerPoint, but we'll forge ahead without it. It's fine. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I would like to say that the, the good news um, is that we're tracking pretty much in the same place we were last month. It's very early in fiscal 16 to be mm -hmm. drawing deep conclusions, but so far so good. Um, as far as FY15, we came in remarkably close to exactly on budget. Um, which was a little surprising to me as well. It turned out that we had encumbrances in lines that over the years that we've been tracking expenses very closely, we make a point at the beginning of the fiscal year to encumber the entire amount we think we're going to need for the fiscal year in items such as cleaning supplies for custodians, custodial contracts, um, energy, uh, gas, um, electricity, the big ticket items that we're always going to pay no matter what happens. And so we encumber the amount and then we pad it a little bit, particularly my staff is eager to make sure we never run short. And so in fact we didn't run short, we ran right on. Um, and I thought we were going to be a little short. So it worked out very well. Interesting. Oh yeah, there it is. Yay! Cool. Oh, thank you for bringing it back. Um, so do I click it this way? Yeah. To, yeah. This With way. your thing. You can just, yeah, the one on the right, the one on the top is the coin. Pointing at the thing. And we don't get the whole thing. It doesn't matter, I got it. Yeah, he can run it from Okay. There. Yeah, it does. Oh, it's the PDF. Yeah, it's a PDF, so oh, just so scroll down. Oh. Okay. <laughs> scroll down. All right. <laughs> so, um, additionally to coming in pretty, pretty much on budget for FY15, we were able to return the $200,000 we promised to the town um, that to be set aside in the next town meeting into a stabilization fund for future special education needs. So it's important to remember that when you look at the final expenses, that $200,000 is not included in our expense amount because we haven't actually spent the money. So it came out of reserves and gone, has gone to the other. <laughs> mm. 
Go, do, go down to the end of the PDF. It should give you the, the size thing on the screen. Make it small. The, the, oh, the hit, minus. The, hit the minus. Hit the, hit the minus. minus. Hit the minus. Right there. Yeah. Right, one more. Here there you go. go. There we go. Yep. Can you go ahead? <laughs> so um, there isn't anything extremely exciting to report. Um, special education continues to be about 30% of budget. Teacher staffing continues to grow modestly. It's gone from 47% in FY11 to 53% in the budget of FY16. Uh, teaching, teaching assistants have been more ripply, but uh, they're going up and they're now, since 11, they're at their highest point of 4.2% of budget. And if you could scroll to the charts. Okay, this first chart shows um, regular education and special education spending in total dollar amounts. The next slide, I think, is very interesting. Special ed is, again, in blue, but as you see, the percentage of total budget has remained remarkably steady over this period of time. And I think that speaks, uh, I think it speaks very well to our management of things. You know, we're undergoing a period of growth, and yet our SPED is holding very steady. If you looked at the backup numbers, for FY15, you'll notice that I did the year-over-year -year percentage growth for special education and that we experienced only 1% growth. Um, we were essentially flat, and I'd like to commend our special ed director for her financial diligence in her first year at holding the line. Um, but we all know special ed needs aren't something that you can hold the line on indefinitely, and I expect, you know, we've already started discussions. I expect that there's going to be significant requests, you know, basically to keep pace with our enrollment growth. Okay, Dr. Allison Ampey. Is this including out of district tuition? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And there's one more, if you if you would. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> torturing you. And this just shows uh, teachers, teaching assistants, and other expenses. So you can see back in '11, other expenses were taking up a, a larger chunk of budget. But this, this these are consistent numbers. It's not like that suddenly there was health insurance in or out or anything like that. This is an apples to apples comparison. So we're shifting more money into teaching services mm -hmm. of various kinds. And uh, I think that's an interesting trend. It certainly speaks to our uh, administrative efficiency as well, mm -hmm. that we're getting it done. So are there questions about either 16 or 15 or anything else I can help right, well, you with? Uh, Mr. Seelman. You know, we had a conversation in, uh, I don't know, FY13, FY14, with, when Kathleen Lockyer was the uh, assistant superintendent for uh, special education, mm -hmm. and about reducing TAs. Yes, and we, so, we did do that. There, you yeah. can see the pinch. And that year, it was decided that rather than having anywhere from six to nine teaching assistants at a school, we'd reduce the teaching assistants to two inclusion TAs, and we would add a second special ed teacher Correct. to each building. And I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but I think we're contemplating the need for additional special ed teachers at the school. Okay. Now, whether that can, re that can result in reducing teaching assistance. You know, as the need grows, right. the cost-effective, fast solution is to add teaching assistance. Right. But once it reaches a certain point, you know, it's, it's penny-wise and pound-foolish. We want to be thinking about licensed professionals, and I think we're reaching that point again. So it wouldn't surprise me if this goes on for a long time, that we'll see TAs get fatter and fatter and then go through a skinny spell and the teachers will bump up and then fatter and fatter and then a skinny spell. Yeah, so I'm just, I'm, okay, so I just want to understand, was there a shift in strategy on yes. TAs? Okay, the yeah, that was very specific so we shifted, to that. Yeah. clearly a couple of years ago. And yes, now we're kind of, and now we've built up the TAs again to keep pace with enrollment growth and IEP demands. Right, I was, just, I was, I was just gonna say that I think that a lot of what you're seeing is that we have put TAs or in a lot of classes that got large. Yeah, right. So yeah, I know that. Although, although the special ed department may not be using them, I know that we're using them in kindergarten classes and a lot of classes where the sizes were so big that we really wanted to make sure there was another set of eyes in there. So yeah, no, that I, could be the reason why, because that's, our class that's sizes definitely have gotten big mm -hmm. as, the, as the enrollment mm -hmm. scrunch is pushing them in. Got it. Thank you. Mr. Hainer. Unusual uh, on the uh, FY expense report. Which year? Uh, 15. Okay. Sorry. 15? Yep. So last year. Uh, on page four. Okay. Um, hold on, I got to get oh, there. Sorry. Which view of 16 uh, of, the, of the FY 15? Expense report. So this year's. Oh, that's yes. FY 16. That's 16. I'm, uh, I, FY it's 15 the one I, expense it, I'm, report. I'm sorry, it's the one I clicked on the. <laughs> 
No, it's always difficult when you're discussing okay, fisc when you're discussing okay, multiple everyone, fiscal years. Okay, every one of the exhibits that were given to us says 15 on it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Does so, it? They say yeah, FY15 right. expense uh, these, report. These, I'm pretty sure this is the It's probably 16. It's, just so it know. says 16 okay. when it's labeled, it's open. Okay. but it, it says as of a 15 date because it's the fall. No, no, no. The titles on our Novus thing. On our Novus the title thing, on Novus is FY15 expense oh. report 10 6 2015. Let's go to 16, and your 16, and see if they, the numbers match. Okay. Okay. On page four. It does say FY16 when you open the document. Oh, it does? Okay, great. <laughs> I just want you to Thank you. It does say that. No. Okay, it's just, all right. It's just a label. I'm looking at it, and I'm not. Okay. Yeah. Not. Okay, so it's the, bu it's the yeah. general fund budget tracking report. Right. Yep. On page four, line uh, there's six. There's only three lines on this report. There's only three pages on this report. No, there's 15 pages. Yep, the one we got. Okay, so that's, that's the FY15 report, the multiple year report. Multiple yes, it's multiple the multiple years. year report. Yes, okay, year, yes. all right, yes, all right. Years. And which view are you looking at? Are you looking at it by org, object, or project? <laughs> However, you send page No, four. the one I have is actual line item uh, numbers. Okay, that's by or, or that's by no, cost I, center. I, mine has line six eight, item number six eight six six, legal services special ed. Six eight six six. Okay, so you're looking at it by program. Six eight six six. I've only been six, doing six. this four years. Someday I'm going to get this right. Okay. Okay. Page okay. four. Yeah. Page four of fifteen in the FY fifteen reports. Right. Okay. I'm with you. I see it now. Legal services, one hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's me? the budget. Yes, that's okay. the FY sixteen right. budget, not the actuals to okay. date. Down just a bit. Six nine zero oh, five. I think two two or three lines down. Yep. It says school committee uh, legal services school committee two hundred fifty two thousand. Mm hmm. Okay. If you go to page seven. Line okay. 83102. Mm -hmm. It says legal services 300,000. 300, mm -hmm. Okay, what's going on there? Well, it's going to get even more uh -huh. because on page 15, the exact same 83102 is for 150,000. Page 15. Well, page 15 is special ed only, because but page, you, page you, 15 is special ed only. I understand. Yeah. But we have it. So the 150 that I first gave you, the 6866, said legal ser services for special ed, it was 150. Yes. 83102 says legal services 150 on page 15. So you just said that that's sped back there. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the exact same line on him, 83102, at it at three hundred thousand dollars because it's a combination of both special ed and general ed. Okay, but it that, doesn't add up to the general well, ed line. Yeah, and the six nine zero five is two hundred fifty two thousand. <laughs> six nine zero oh five. Trying to cover you, Siobhan. Sorry, sorry. Six nine zero. Oh so I mean, Diane, you always keep work it out, but it, it, the numbers not. just didn't. I, I'm sorry. I'm finding it very difficult to stay with you. Okay. I, I, it would have been helpful if you could have emailed me ahead of time. Okay. On this one. I just found it tonight. I mean, just look at. I will. I will send you an email on this. Please I do. Apologize. I'll be. I'll be happy to no, answer. No. Uh, but I'm. I'm having I, a hard I, time I, following I, you. Just want to say for the public, I had done some emailing with Diane on on, a, on another number. Quick service, straighten me right out. All right. Enjoy happens. So yeah, I don't. I don't know what's going on in six nine zero five. I. Okay. I don't know what's going on there. Okay. Uh, I suspect. Oh, yep. I do know what's going on there. What's going on there is you're seeing the combination of both the money set aside for legal services and for settlements, because they would both be under that program code, but legal settlements okay. appears on a different object. Okay. So it's you, you're you're looking at three different okay. cuts at the I, data. It would make it easier for me. I don't know about the rest of the committee. If we had a straight item line item that said. Total legal expenses budgeted, and then breakdown for sped settlement or whatever you want to do it. Because it was just difficult to, in my head, and it, well, you just answered it. But the three hundred thousand, the difference between the three hundred thousand and the two fifty-two. Well, there are three pools of money for legal. There's okay. a there's a pool of money for special ed legal. There's a pool of money for general ed legal, and there's a pool of money for legal settlements that could be used for either. Okay. And that would be our total legal expenses budgeted for Right. And they're depending on the view, either in two places or three. 
Okay, but we don't have a total. Is that 300,000 our total? That is, is the amount of both special ed legal and general ed legal. And the settlement line is 98. I'm quoting from fallible memory here. Okay, we'll but, talk, we'll talk. Yeah. Talk off camera. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Hearing none. Thank you. Superintendent's report. You, you, you're sitting all nice and comfy in the back. <laughs> in the chair of honor. Bob, is there any chance they could block the light? Oh, thank you. Spotlight. It's, it's very powerful. I have a few things this evening. First of all, I want to start out um, by recognizing Laura Chesson. She was invited um, this year to present at the CIO Summit Conference in Chicago last week to talk about our technology uh, program vision. And this was a, a conference that was, that was sponsored by the Journal of Technology and Learning. So I want to congratulate her. It's, 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 a, it's an honor for Arlington that one of, our, um, one of our administrators has been asked to come and present. And, and I'm going to ask her if she would just talk for a second or two, or maybe longer than that, uh, about what were the, the main messages you were giving the um, the nice part about the conference for us is that we were recognized for something that we talked about last year and that we don't put in technology for technology's sake, that we developed an educational vision and an instructional foci and that we made choices around technology that would help us to support that. Um, when I got to the conference, I knew that's why they had asked me to come and speak um, on a panel on uh, moving initiatives forward. Um, but I was really struck by my two days. Um, it was a very long two days. It's actually a working session of 50 um, CIOs, chief information officers, and assistant superintendents and superintendents from around the country. Um, there were folks there from Michigan and Illinois, Texas, California, New York, um, several other people from Massachusetts. Um, and uh, so you work from about 8 o'clock in the morning to 9.30 each night for two days um, in working groups. And uh, it became apparent to me that we actually have a very different philosophy than many other school districts. And there were many school districts there that were all about the technology and um, the technical aspects of it. And uh, so it was, it was quite different. It, it was, we got a lot of positive feedback from the work that we're doing in Arlington. Um, there were a number of districts that asked to um, contact us to uh, talk to, us, to me at um, further length about the work that we're doing because it is quite different. Um, and I think that speaks to our success. All right. Well, anyway, we're, we're glad that you went and represented us. And I think that's the important message, too. And I think it's important as we increasingly spend large amounts of money to say that we're doing it very carefully, strategically. Whenever we begin a, a particular new initiative, for example, the sixth grade uh, this year is now a one-to-one -one grade in our middle school, it began with a pilot. And so there's, all, there's steps of um, looking at where we're going before we sort of just jump in and supply a lot of devices without having any plan for them. So I commend Laura for your work on this. I want to touch base on the enrollment. You received the enrollment report. Um, I, I cannot say these are official numbers. I'm going to get the official numbers for you. But where we stand right now and there's been a lot of fluctuation, is that we are about 2% over what our numbers were last year. And the fluctuation that's occurred, and if you've looked at these reports all month, is our, our two, people who, our two people who are working with data um, making sure that there are, that students, obviously, that are registered are represented in power school, but almost equally important, that students that have withdrawn are, are, represent, are, are withdrawn from power school as well, so those numbers 
are as accurate as they can possibly be. So in that process, there's been a lot of, you know, one week it looks like we have a 3% growth, then it goes down 2.5. It's, it's been bouncing all over. And so I'll give you the, the final numbers um, once I have those. But the big picture of it all is that we're, we're growing. And that, that trend of 2% um, actually on a population of over 5,000, when we say we're going to have uh, 1,000 students in 10 years, it, it, it would be based on um, doing exactly that, growing at about 2% every year. So what we're seeing is real, uh, at least in, right now, and of course, as you know from the, the forecasting that was done, that um, th this is a, is, is a big problem, and we've spent a lot of time already this evening on it, but um, I think that it's worth saying that it, it is a problem that we can't put our heads in the sand about and we have to find a solution that we all can agree is the best for Arlington. And I'm confident that we will. The other thing um, I want to um, mention, which I did in the newsletter that came out this week, is that Arlington is experiencing, just like a lot of communities in, in Massachusetts, but perhaps even a little bit more so, um, the opiate crisis. And it is a significant issue. Um, I think one of the things that's been a problem over the years with this is the, sort of the stigma and the shame that has gone on with people not wanting to admit to a, uh, an addiction, which has contributed, I think, to a lot of the, um, the overdose. We have, an, we have an incredible police and fire department in this town, and I, and I, I truly mean that. Uh, a number of people are alive today because of their quick action and their planning about having Narcan available um, and responding so quickly in times of crisis. And they're also being very proactive, the police department's being very proactive in, uh, once they have identified perhaps a, a, an individual who may be in, in high risk, of educating their family about Narcan and also providing it. So we have a very proactive police department, and we also have, which is somewhat unique in Arlington, a co coalition of all of the all of the um, all of the um, human services part, including the public schools, that is represented on the <coughs> coalition for substance abuse, which is now the new director being Ivy Laplante. This coalition, which has members of the school committee, selectmen, virtually every group in town is a member of, is represented that has some, um, some aspect of service in this community, is sponsoring a forum on October 13th, and that is going to be here in town hall um, from 6.30 to 8.30, focusing on identifying the community solutions in Arlington. And uh, we have uh, our Attorney General Moore Healy coming to be the keynote speaker on this. So it's again October 13th here at Town Hall from 6.30 to 8.30. A um, Couple more things. Uh, uh, Laura, would you like to uh, mention something about the Power School portal where we're moving with that? Yes. Um, I know that many parents and even school committee members have expressed um, frustration with the fact that if you have multiple students in the district, you have to have multiple power school logons and um, uh, passwords. Um, over the next two weeks, we'll be putting in the new um, upgrade to power school, uh, 9.1, and that will have a single logon and a single sign-on for um, parents who have multiple students in the district. Um, parents will get um, a uh, email fr um, or letter from their child's school um, that will uh, talk about um, how, to, how to do that and will give you all kinds of directions. It's pretty straightforward, um, but you will have a single sign-on, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, oh, one of my frustrations is my computer won't save it as a cookie, so you have to keep re like remembering this thing. Is it, will that change? The, so, so you can't. It won't save your password on it, so you have to 
constantly go I, back to I'm this. not sure, but I will check into that okay. and I will let you know. Okay. Uh, a quick Stratton update. Uh, last night, and, uh, we had a, uh, we hosted a parent meeting at Stratton and thank Mr. Hainer for attending as well, in which our architect, actually both arch two architects from DRA presented uh, to the parents what the, what, the, what the status of the plan is, looking at modulars and answering a lot of questions. I was taking notes because there were a number of uh, very good suggestions uh, that, that were offered by parents to think about. We, we're going to be simultaneously as we work through the details of all of the modular classrooms and the, the challenges those present just in terms of the topography of the site, um, but we also need to be planning for a lot of detail. And we're, we have lists, we have parent advisory groups, and uh, we will be ready when school opens next year. But between now and then, there's going to be, need to be a significant amount of planning, um, right, right down to even the moves and how the, how the cafeteria space is used. And, and, um, you know the kinds of coverings that will go on the walkways. It's just there's just the detail is 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 significant. I will say that probably um, it might pale in comparison to the the detail that's required when you move schools into various sites. Having gone through that experience once, <clears throat> um, I want to report on the flag situation. Mr. Hainer brought to um, my attention, the fact that we have a number of our flagpoles at the schools which are not illuminated. And under the guidelines, um, flags should only be, um, should only remain on the pole 24 hours if there is illumination. So our director of facilities, um, Ruthie Bennett, has been looking into this and it's been interesting um, that it's a, there's a variety of reasons for the poles which are not lit, why they're not lit. One of, a couple, in couple, one case, I think the lights are just broken. In a couple of other cases, the lights were turned off because of complaints from neighbors about the lights shining in their mm -hmm. homes. So one of the, one of the strategies that facilities has is looking at and they already have done it on one pole is to actually put the light at the top of the pole going down mm -hmm. and it's a solar powered uh, battery operated um, uh, alternative and so this is we're in the process of of going the direction of making sure that all of our poles are lit it's not going to happen in the next couple of days. It's going to take a little bit of time, uh, particularly if, you're, if these battery-powered lights are going to be mounted on the, on the flagpoles in which there's an issue of illumination in the neighborhood. But I expect that, that will, it'll, it will not take a long time. I can't give you exact timeline when it will be complete, but I'll certainly report out when it is. In the meantime, flags that um, I think there were two schools that were f afraid. And... Um, those flags are being replaced, um, and I think all of our flags will be in very good shape. And I know there's a policy that I think you're going to do a first read on this evening, and uh, I'll say right now that I, I fully support it. I think that it's, it's definitely something that the school department can, and the facilities department, because we work hand in hand, in hand on that. It's, it's um, uh, this kind of work as we move into this new era of a joint uh, facilities department is something where we do have to work very collaboratively, and we are. So I'll give you an update when we have all of them completed, and also we have a pole still that needs to be replaced at the high school, which our legal department has been working on, because uh, there was a mal, uh, that pole was, um, I think there was a manufacturing defect in them, so, but our legal department is working on getting that pole replaced. I don't have a timeline when it's going to happen, but it's certainly going to happen this year. Um, you also had in Novus the uh, information from EDCO lab and case. 
Uh, we, we belong to two of these collaboratives, and I can talk about this more at another time, but I just wanted you to be aware and the community to be aware that in the spirit of trying to be collaborative, our collaboratives are looking at whether there's any kind of financial or programmatic um, advantages to doing some kind of, a, of, a, of greater collaboration all the way up to the possible merger. So it's the analysis of that is beyond what I think a, a board, a finance, finance committee of those boards can handle. So all the boards have agreed to uh, split the cost of having a consultant hired to uh, provide us with some thoughts about all that and we have a timeline of this year. So I don't think I'll be really reporting back on that much before later in the spring when we have more information. Excuse me. Do we have a figure of how much we will be contributing? Um, lab, each, each of the collaboratives will contribute 15000 mm -hmm. up to 15000 The RFPs have been sent out, <clears throat> and I don't know where the bids have come in. Do we do we have Mr. to vote? Hainer? Do we have to vote that, or is that discretionary from the superintendent? It's not discretionary from the superintendent. It's the boards of the collaboratives, of which it's I'm a representative. Right, but of we're both. being assessed for fifteen thousand. Am I correct? Did I misunderstand it? Well, not this school. This school committee individually. No. Oh, well, it's a total of fifteen thousand for for the. It, it comes I misunderstood. out. I'm sorry. Yeah, it comes out of the budgets of the different collaboratives. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions regarding the superintendent's report? Mr. Thielman. Have, have you, so we have the, Octo, this, the, the, the enrollment data, is that October 1 data, or, what, or is this? The date on what you have is October 5th. Um, okay, so it's. Uh, it's so I don't, ha I, I, I don't have what is called, the, so the, these are the official October 1 numbers, um, but I will get that for you. Okay, because there's a there's there is a discrepancy between our current numbers and what Dr. McKibben projected in his analysis by about 143. Or, or well, the answer is um, yes and no. Um, this these numbers here represent K to 12. Dr. McKibben's was preschool to 12. Okay. <clears throat> so add another. And out of district. And out of district, yes. Yeah. He looked simply at the buildings. He did, and he included, because the preschool is part of our, lives in our high school. So you would add roughly 60 students to this number in order to compare apples to apples. So he came at 5399, so if he added 60, that would put us at uh, 5306. Yeah. Oh, they don't include the audit. So, it's, so you know what would be good to have at the we next need, meeting? Yes, we can do a, that next week to, to, yeah. show, to show how they match up. Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. uh, could you do that the next yes, we can do that. two weeks from now? How, does, how do we compare to McKibben's numbers? Mm -hmm. Dr. McKibben's numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. These numbers don't include out of district, do they? No, that, I didn't these think so. Don't. These numbers do not count out of district either. No, these are building numbers. Oh, okay. right. These are building yeah. numbers. Yes. Well, don't do it on the fly. Just, yeah. just yeah. get us the report. I, I, please. <laughs> yeah, right. Because it would be good to know. The, yeah. Just, just for clarification, we have two schools that have illumination on those flags. The light goes straight up. Mm. It does not go. It, it's designed just to do that. That's at Thompson and at uh, Pierce. And uh, I, is this a collaboration to put the power in for the other schools? Because the, I, most of them have lights. It's just that they're either broken or they were turned off because of neighborhood complaints. Okay, if the, if the light is designed right, it goes straight up. It does not disperse. And, and at the one at Thompson, I wasn't even sure if it was on until I got on top of it. And as soon as you get on top of it, it goes straight up and it hits the flag the way it's supposed to. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Seuss? Oh, one of the things I was struck by the enrollment numbers is how much retention we had at from fifth grade to sixth grade. So we have a 97% retention rate. And I'm wondering if you think, meaning that 
in last year's fifth grade was 520, sorry, 424, and this year's sixth grade is 410. And I'm wondering do you, if you think that that is a momentary aberration, or I mean, we, of course we don't know, or if you have any, any information, okay. <laughs> I mean, we don't, of course, we don't entirely know what's going on with trends, but. We, we, we don't know. Yeah. Um, generally, when we, so, so how I think about when I go from fifth grade to, to, to sixth grade enrollment, generally it's been in the neighborhood of a number of kids, of roughly about 10, 40, 30 to 40 kids. Right. Uh, and that's pretty much how we've been looking at it. This year is much higher than we thought it might be. And so the retention level was higher. Now, on Poor the other hand, in, maybe we, oh, yeah. on the other hand, um, Ms. Johnson's projections based on the mathematical formula and Dr. M Dr. McKibben's predicted a much higher kindergarten number than we're seeing because the birth cohort, I think for that, for this particular group was something like 560, if I remember, it was very high. And we were looking, we were taking our, what was low, but our, our usual ret retention from that birth cohort to kindergarten is in that 84, 85%. So we, we thought for sure we were going to have a, a class over 500 as well. But that did not happen. On the other hand, one of the things Dr. McKibben has said is the real indicator you got to watch is not so much kindergarten, but first grade. And first grade did go up this year. Another sort of a uh, surprise to me was that when you actually take the number of students, um, there actually was more, uh, there was a greater number of students, well, it, it, it just keeps changing from week to week, but, but there were a lot more students entering the high school uh, than we would have expected this year. So there's always some surprises, and, and, it's, and it's not a perfect science. Actually, one of the things I was wondering is whether that reflects the sort of the desirability of Arlington Middle and High Schools as compared to sort of the neighboring areas that there might be sort of move-ins that we're seeing well, just sort of greater people we're moving when in. We, when we saw our registrations this summer, they were not, the, the new people coming to Arlington were not just elementary parents. Right. We were seeing it across the board. And it was evidenced out by the, the increase we have in the high, at the high school. Uh, I have, obviously, we're sitting in the selectmen's hearing room because we've done the coup d'etat and we're, we've taken over all Yes, what about the, the elevator? <laughs> so uh, the reason why we're here actually is the lack of an elevator. And so you have an update on that? We have not had word as to whether it's the, the part has been machined and ready to ship. Mm -hmm. it ha they haven't, they've been, we don't know. These are comfy chairs. We might be here a while. <laughs> I think you excuse will. Me, I, excuse me, excuse oh, me. I'm sorry. I think you're going to be and here the and next. And when Mr. Pierce comes back, one is, you're going to be around the corner. <laughs> well, we're going to have to have, an, I think we're going to have to have another, uh, another off-site yeah. meeting, the next meeting for sure. Mm -hmm. What? We have to November 12th, the following month, so there might be a chance we'll be back in the school committee room by then. It's Any very hard. I will say one thing. It is very hard on our custodians. The, oh, the, I can imagine. It, IT. And, IT. Every, and uh, it's been very hard because even though it's just bringing up paper. Yeah. The upside is MSBA had to climb the stairs, didn't they? <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. How are our students handling it? Um, our students are handling it fine. We have one student who's in a wheelchair, and they, they, they have a plan between every class and how that wheelchair gets moved up and down stairs. Mm. It's carried. Mm. Mm. Wow. Ouch. Ouch. Right. So in, in every respect, it's, it's, it's hard um, to have only one elevator. And I certainly, in any kind of plan for a school this size, we have to have two elevators. At least. At, at two that. elevators. Just even just to have them on the, the two ends of the, the building. building yeah. Yeah. At least, yeah. Yeah. MSBA, um, as you know, visited. <laughs> and the, the day after they were here, on the, that stormy day where we had a deluge, mm -hmm. um, we had a fire drill at the high school. Oh, yeah. 
fortunately between the raindrops a little bit because water had gotten into the walls and tripped the fire alarm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Though that also happened, well, actually, the, the water part happened at, I think, Bishop, I think. Yeah, yeah. but then, then Audison also had a, a fire drill. They were out in the rain. They, and they were out in the rain, in the heavy rain. So, but I did let um, MSBA know about, about that, that they just, they missed the event. And, and, and that we have a significant line item in our budget for duct tape. Yes, we do. Okay. Anything else? Uh, questions on the superintendent's report? Uh, hearing none, we are now to the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which the event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of Warrant 16048, dated September 24th, 2015. Total warrant amount $314,125.65. Approval of minutes, approval of draft school committee regular minutes, dated September 24th, 2015. Approval of job description, field monitor supervisor. Without an objection, moved by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Ms. Starks. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That is a unanimous vote. Subcommittee and liaison reports. Policies and procedures. Dr. Alice Nampy. Okay. So acting as in lieu of Mr. Pierce, who was chair, um, policy met on, I don't know, in, in the end of like the 28th of September. Um, we discussed a few different, we discussed the bullying policy and the physical restraint policy. We think they've been updated as required by the legislature, um, but uh, Ms. Bouvier is going to check if there's any mandates that need to be addressed. We discussed JEB, um, which is looking at the kindergarten age. We've done some research, we're gonna do some more. We'll talk, to, talk about that later. Um, and we talked about some others, but the main one that we talked about was the flag policy, which Bill, uh, Mr. Hainer brought to us. After making some minor changes, we voted to bring this to the full school committee for first read. So that's what you have in your packet. And I actually don't remember what it, what letter did he assign it? JT. JT. Okay. Um, so it would be policy JT. It discusses um, having budgets for sufficient funds to replace, to ensure that there's an ad a flag in appropriate condition for each school in the district, that um, how the flags will be displayed, what kind of flags will be done, um, and how uh, other things regarding whether, if they're put up and down by students. Um, and so we're putting this out here for first read we heard from the superintendent. One thing we were waiting on as a committee was if there was anything that the superintendent had to bring that would shape the policy, like we can't get the flags up and down, so they all have to be on. Um, but I didn't really hear any insurmountable uh, problems, so we present this to you for first read. Any questions or comments on policy JICG Tobacco or JT, the flag, Mr. Hainer? Just a comment on the policy. I looked at the old policy on tobacco and the current one. Neither one has uh, state regulation references in it. And I, I'm, I'm sure that there are state, at least regulations stuff that specifically address uh, schools being tobacco free. We've added the, the other categories as a result of that presentation. I just ask. Okay. So, okay, so we'll keep both of those back. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. I'll take Any other those. questions or comments on the first reads? Okay. The JT. Uh, Mr. Thielman. JT. So the, the only question I have about that, the Arlington School Committee shall provide in its annual budget sufficient funds to maintain a flag that is in appropriate condition for each school in the district. I mean, I think I'm always wary of putting in a policy we shall maintain because it's if it's the policy, we just have to follow it and the district has to find the money. So it's, it's I think it could be worded, the Arlington School Committee shall maintain a flag that is in appropriate condition for each school in the district. Mm -hmm. I can accept that. Yeah, I mean, it, 
That's okay. fine. Yeah, so I, mean, I just think it's a friendly yeah. sort of a memo. We don't, because there's really don't, we don't think, I don't think there's anywhere in the policies that I can recall where we say we shall have sufficient funds in the budget to do X. As you stated, it meets the criteria. Yeah, yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. I'll bring that back and just, and DIBs <coughs> needed references. Yeah. Anything else? No, that's it. Okay. With that objection, these two policies have uh, completed first reading. Uh, anything else from policies and procedures? No. Budget. Uh, Dr. Allison Anthony. <laughs> now I'm with my budget hat on. Um, budget will be meeting in the next couple of weeks. Um, I'll send out a doodle. We need to come up with a budget calendar. Thank you. Thank you. Facilities, uh, Cindy Starks. All right. Um, well, seems to be the talk of the day. Um, so my having had the meeting on the 24th, um, I feel like we need to move forward, but I'm not really sure how to move forward. Mm -hmm. Because as I said tonight, I don't think this is just our decision. I mean, I think we can drive it because we're the ones with the problem and we need to kind of come up with or at least help get a solution. But um, you know, I don't, I mean, I, I, I don't know who to involve. I don't know who to, I mean, I don't feel like as the facilities subcommittee that oh. that is the right, it's too small, it's too whatever to kind of move this forward. I feel like we need to include, if nothing else, the other members of those committees in the town, you know, even if it's not, even if the next meeting doesn't necessarily include like a lot of public participation, we at least need a meeting with the town manager and the, you know, uh, you know, all the building people and the money people and try to figure out how we want to move this forward. I mean, I do agree that we need to understand, you know, from probably from the superintendent what the timeline is. Um, you know, I feel like we need a lot more thought on a lot more possibilities. I, I really want to have some kind of a brainstorming session where we put any wacky and crazy and whatever idea out there and try to get our heads around what, you know, what we're thinking. Um, and then, and then, but I, I just, so as, as the, I feel like I, I, as the facilities, you know, chair I felt like I should have more but I feel like I, every time I try to come up with a plan I feel like well, is it even my place to have a plan yet because I feel like that meeting so said to me wow this is such a big decision um, so I'm kind of coming to this meeting you know kind of asking all of you kind of what do you think how do we think we should move this forward and and kind of you know I'm willing to take direction and kind of take input as to how we should kind of proceed. Well, let me, let me say this, is that we dance around two domains here. We're talking about a facilities issue, but it, we're really engaging in the, in, the, in the pool of community relations, in going out to the community, making our case, gathering support, soliciting opinions, developing maybe a website or some other format where people can where we can aggregate select, uh, 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 suggestions and uh, talk about possibilities. Uh, so that my idea on doing this is to arrange some sort of a joint uh, responsibility between facilities and community relations and seeing it's probably more of a communi community relations issue with community relations sort of being in the lead of this to come up with some sort of a process for uh, collecting uh, suggestions, opinions, thoughts, ideas, and pushing information, the, the information that folks have asked for out to the community. Uh, so I'll ask uh, Dr. Seuss to talk, uh, speak on this first, then I'll go to Mr. Hainer. Um, so yeah, so I, I see there's sort of two um, things that we need to do, and, and they need not be the same committee. So one is sort of a working group that m has to include town manager, capital planning, mm -hmm. school committee, so forth. We're, we're, mm -hmm. we're mm -hmm. nitty gritty stuff like, mm -hmm. how do we get the money, you know, is dealt with. Right. Um, there's also a secondary thing, which is very appropriate for community relations, which is outreach to the community, engagement with the community, soliciting ideas, publicizing ideas. Um, and luckily, 
the chair of the facilities committee is also on the community relations committee. So that's, that's true. that really How helps. How good is that? <laughs> so um, so I, th I think those are two separate things, mm -hmm. although I think I encourage people to go to both sort of types of meetings. Um, we do have a community relations um, subcommittee meeting on November 2nd. I don't know if that feels too late to people to talk about ideas. I mean, that certainly was going to be one of the agenda items um, on it. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I think a, a, a website, a public forum where that's sort of an open, you know, gather in small groups, come together, um, just to solicit ideas, engage the community would be the right kind of approach to take at this point. Um, does November 2nd feel too late to sort of come up with those ideas or? I'll ask for the opinion yeah. of the committee. Uh, Mr. Hainer. I agree with Ms. Starks that this is something that has to be a broad community thing. We said that tonight, each one of us, in one way or another. I think the template for that was that community meeting that we had on the 24th of September. We don't need to have every member of a board there. I would, I would suggest that, that there are two basic policy committees in this town, the school committee and the selectmen, but it's important to engage the other committees, finance and uh, uh, capital planning and stuff like that. Um, I would suggest that uh, through either the chair or uh, Ms. Starks, an invitation go out and invite one member of them. I think community engagement itself mm -hmm. should happen once a, a plan is formed to what, what materials that are needed or at least start that with the, these committees and then open it up. Uh, just to be, what? I'm not suggesting not listening to the community. I think that's most important because you're not going to pass anything without community involvement and engagement. But I think it's important that a, a small core group initially start it and expand from that. Uh, so that's my opinion. Mr. Thielman. I think it's important for us to get a sense of what the deadlines are in this whole process. Yeah. yeah. So when do we have to make a decision that impacts the tenants at the Gibbs facility by contract, by, by uh, our lease agreement? And then, uh, you know, what are, what are the timelines uh, for, and what are the decision points? And so I would, you know, I think, I think a, a, an efficient way to do this is to ask the superintendent and the town manager to tell us that, mm -hmm. to kind of give us a memo on here are the decision points, here are the deadlines, and then once we get that memo, which I think you can probably do in, I mean, I don't, We're I don't, already talking You're about doing it. it, so you, we can get it in two weeks. Once we get that, then we can figure out which committees need to meet. Mm -hmm. And no matter what we do, once we get the memo that tells us what the decision points are and the deadlines are, you know, <laughs> making sure that there's a lot of public input is absolutely critical. We're gonna have no credibility. Yeah. And, and a decision pass, too. Dr. Allison Ampey? I have questions that I would love facilities to, to um, field. There are things that when I start thinking about trying to make a decision like this, there are information that I'd like to have, and I'll, I'll send them to you, but it's things like, what's the impact of two small core spaces on students? What's the educational effect of schools with different compositions, with single grade, or if you move the eighth grade to the high school, you know, whether pluses or minuses? Um, does the point of too small vary per core space? And how do the different schools, how are they set up? You know, maybe the Audison cafeteria can only handle a thousand kids for cafeteria. I'm sorry, the Audison cafeteria can only handle a thousand kids, but the gyms can handle 1,200. You know, we need to know where these mm -hmm. spots mm -hmm. are. Um, what do modulars look like? How do they function? How do they age? Um, if mechanicals in them break down, can they be replaced? And what's, you know, what's the timelines for this? Because for many of these decisions, we're not just spending money now, we're, we're encumbering our future mm -hmm. members to spend money later. And I'd like to have some idea of when those chunks of money are gonna be coming due. Um, I'm not saying you can answer all of these no, things, no, but I some of, I, I, it, feel like, it's, I feel like that's a great way to do it is to, start asking the higher level questions. Yeah, it's, we're going to need this information that, no matter it what. And then, make the decisions yes. as we move forward. Yeah, so that's, yeah. so I was going to send you those, and I've got more, um, but it, it's stuff like mm -hmm. that, that I think, you know, these are things where I'm going, do I go this way or do I go that way? And I need to know this sort of thing. And maybe other people have other ideas, but right. that's, 
He was stuck. So I, I think I think what I'm I'm hearing is that if I can, uh, I think that what we probably need is a facilities subcommittee meeting, mm -hmm. and at that maybe invite the town manager, and we can talk about timelines, and we can talk mm -hmm. about some of these higher level questions mm -hmm. and start getting a picture of the questions we want answered as well as what our timeline is, especially given the enrollment numbers aren't quite as bad as we thought well, We don't know yet. Be. We're waiting for that report. Right. So um, all of that, right? So all of those kind of moving parts. Um, so I feel like maybe something actually around November or, you know, but within a week or two, um, you know, of that, and then, and that, that will help us in the planning part. And that I agree that community, re it also allows community relations to go off and do community relations stuff, mm -hmm. which is gather that input mm -hmm. and help kind of figure out all of the stuff that people yeah. are saying and kind of help help kind of um, you know pull that together as well. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thielman. Yeah, I agree with that. I think okay. set the meeting, and that also gives a deadline for a report yeah. from the superintendent and the town manager, and then we can look at the timelines and the decision points. Because as Lori Cole said, you know, one decision, one decision yeah. that you make creates, uh, exactly. eliminates other options. So the other thing that I want to say is that I'm all in favor of getting all the town boards and all people in the town involved in the process. But at the and I'm, I don't know. I haven't seen a memo on the process yet. I'm, a, a task force could be a good thing, but at the end of the day, it's an educational decision. Mm -hmm. So it's a school committee decision. It's a school committee vote. Yeah. Um, and I just want to put that out there. Yeah. It's ultimately this board's responsibility. We have to get the money from the right people. Yeah, we, we do, <laughs> but there's, a, but there's, but we, can't, but we, we can't make a decision to just go build all yeah. kinds of new schools and. Mm -hmm. But let me the speak to that. Let me speak to that. Let me speak yeah. to that because we have the experience at the Thompson School and the other schools. So there is a process mm -hmm. that the school committee drives. Yes. To get the capital planning committee, the town meeting, mm -hmm. the town manager, mm -hmm. the board of selectmen. We've been through that before. There's a process we drive to get those folks on board with a vote right. for funding. Right. So we will, you know, we, and that could happen, can happen, it should happen again, might happen again, depending on what our options are. Right. Okay. I'm going to Thank take you. these out of order, do community relations, then go back to district accountability. Wait, wait, I still oh, have a question. Quickly. Okay. A quick question. Go ahead. Oh. You can go first. Well, I, have, I, I have another question on okay. facilities. Oh, okay. Oh, no, I actually, I just had a comment that um, that I think these conversations can go on in parallel. So yes. that, mm -hmm. right, so that we don't have to wait for one to right. get the other. Exactly, okay. and I, I agree that Make that bad. really helps free it up. Yes, yeah. yeah. I think this that's right. Um, I'm still, I was wondering if we can get an update on the Hardy Playground. Ah, yes. <laughs> Contracts are in my, in my inbox. Oh. And um, I'm waiting for a timeline from them. They're reaching out to their vendors for parts. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, community relations. Oh, so we haven't met since the last meeting, um, but we have one scheduled. It's very hard to schedule. Uh, November 2nd. So in which we will discuss um, a little bit of the survey result from last year. I just want to present a report to the committee. Um, certainly all this stuff about how we're going to reach out to the community, about the changes happening. And um, there was one other thing which I forgot. That's, that's probably, that's our big agenda. Okay. District accountability, curriculum instruction and assessment. We'll meet, some, we'll meet sometime after the superintendent's evaluation process is complete for this year. Okay. Executive session, minute review subcommittee. One person has met his obligations, still, still waiting for the other two. Uh, I am sh ashamed I'm one of the well, other Who are the other two? I, <laughs> Mr. Pierce and uh, our chair. Oh, good. So I'm glad it wasn't. Okay, good. No, it wasn't you. <laughs> oh, my God, then I forget that. It's not I, your fault. I, I would have already, already You would have pinged me. I know. I would have so, told you. I would have told you. Okay, thank I'm, you. Yeah. A uh, special study group on superintendent evaluation has gone away. Warrant committee, Mr. Hainer. Uh, the warrant, warrants have been signed. Um, and I would ask, uh, at one time we had announcements for the from the committee members. We're going to go to that as soon as we're done with the warrant committee. It got signed and everybody got paid as far as Ooh. I know. Excellent. Now, do any members have any uh, uh, announcements at all, Mr. Heiner? Just want to uh, commend the superintendent and uh, the architects uh, that were up at Stratton in their presentation the other night. Uh, there were quite a few questions by the parents. Uh, Several of them redesigned, wanted different things to happen, and uh, 
I, I commend the uh, the architects how they answered it uh, clearly and upfront and uh, the uh, safety of the children and every, some very good questions from parents last night uh, and it was quite a few people there mm -hmm. uh, very active and uh, it went well I thought uh, I stayed for the because I'm the liaison and now at Stratton I stayed for, uh, afterwards and there was no continued discussion on it so I think they were very satisfied from what they heard they're going to continue mm -hmm. to be active in it but it went well thank you Ms. Starks um, I just wanted to let people know that um, I know that the Thompson, we've been in it for a while, but we're almost done with the video. Uh -huh. We uh -huh. made a video about rebuilding the Thompson. Um, we started it almost a year before we, or the, you know, once, once it had been voted. I know a lot of people here were actually in the video because I've been editing it and voicing over all the stuff, but we're getting down to the point where, I don't know, I'm thinking maybe the end of the year, but I'm pretty excited about it. So I'm, I'm pretty excited that we did it. I Be, think everyone's going to like it. Before we build a new Thompson. Yeah, so okay, it was all good, about good. the process, and then you know we interviewed a bunch of people about it, and it was really kind of trying to get the whole, kind of give everybody kind of an inside view and you know the emotion as well as the process. And, and um, so I'm pretty excited about it. So okay. when it comes out, I'll let everybody know, but it, we're getting close. A new career? No. <laughs> Anyone else under announcements or other such assorted stuff? Okay, uh, we are now to the point where we will uh, have a, entertain a motion to go into executive session to we conduct to. strategy sessions in preparation. I think we do. No? Yes? No. no? I don't think so. We do not need an executive session. Did anybody? Uh, so I guess uh, Ms. Starks just moved to adjourn. Sure. <laughs> um, seconded by Second. Dr. Seuss. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We're done. Done. Awesome.